Good morning, Councillor Collins. Good morning. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, everybody. Okay, are we ready to go, Tracy? Holly will give us the go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Everybody. Good morning. Okay. Um. Okay, are we ready to go, Tracy? As soon as the YouTube comes Holly on, Richard. The, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Chow. I'm chair of the Committee of uh, Adjustment. So um, we'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, are there any additions? I know there are two uh, two deletions, uh, number four, uh, 4.2 and 4.3. Is there, is there anything else? You hear me, Tracy? Yeah, I can hear you, and I'm hearing none. Okay. Uh, could I get someone to adopt the agenda? I do, Richard. Councilor Harper. Moved by Dave. Get a seconder, please. I'll second I'll it. Moved by, uh, seconded by Joel. Does anyone have a pecuniary interest to disclose? None noted. Uh, Tracy, would you please uh, proceed with the public portion of the meeting? Um, absolutely. So um, I'm going to start with 4.1 on the agenda. This is a um, meeting is a committee of adjustment to consider consent application for a severance and an easement um, under the Planning Act. Back in December of last year, um, we this um, application had provisional consent um, to propose for the severance of one lot into two residential lots. And um, as the process was going through, it was noted that an easement would have been, was also required um, in the process to um, allow access to the severed land, the um, retained lands and the lands to the north. Um, they're also known as um, a 100 Gross Lane, I believe. Yeah, it is here. Um, so in order to do that, they had to um, resubmit an application um, for the easement. And in the process of doing that, they also apply to restart the application, um, reapply for the application to restart those one year timelines. So this is what the application is for. Everybody probably on the committee is, is familiar with this as well. Holly, can I ask you if you could just go to the survey? So as it's hard to see on here, but um, part four and part five is where the easement uh, would have to or is, and I'm going to go to. So you can see the. Um, where the easements are, and it's it's kind of a complicated and it seems like it's a small thing that doesn't need to be done but yet it's it needed to be done it's it's the legal descriptions when you're reading them is kind of complicated and it takes a while to get it through but it does uh, make sense and um, this has to be done in order for them to all um, get legal access so moving on um we had to resubmit the notice as well um, and so we did that and the property owners um, within the 60 meters received or was they were mailed out on November 25th and staff had put these signs up um, and speaking with the property owner they weren't in the area and had requested that we put the signs up so we did that for them on November 18th and um, oh sorry I'm leaving the So yes, we had put the signs up and um, as staff and they were confirmed that they were up. So I'd like to proceed on to um, if anybody has any comments 
um, in regards to this to site inspections on this one at this point. And noted, does the applicants have anything that they would like to add to this meeting as well? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> um, so moving on, it's, it's pretty standard. The same um, There was no public comments received and the planners had received what they um, had wanted to or had provided information within the planning report. So with um, that being said, um, and there's no comments um, from the committee or the applicants, I would recommend that the um, decision be approved, um, provided by or pending on the conditions. And I can read them out. Um, that the applicant provide the township with a transfer deed, a copy of the reference plan to be despotted at the land registry office that's substantially in compliance with the application sketch, and a schedule describing the severed parcel and naming the grantor and grantee attached to the transfer for approval processes. Payment of all municipal legal and planning fees associated with processing the application. That the proposed retained lots and the severed lot be subject to a zoning bylaw amendment application to deal with appropriate items which do not comply with the township zoning bylaw. That the applicant provide confirmation to the sound township that exists that the existing septic systems are legal and look are in good working order to satisfaction of the township. Confirmation that access to Grouse Lane for the proposed severed lands has been accommodated by a strip of land with a minimum width of six meters and a minimum frontage of six meters on Grouse Lane. That the required easement to provide for legal access to the proposed retained and severed lands as well as the adjacent property to the north located at 100 Grouse Lane are registered on title to the satisfaction of the township. And that the the applicants meet all financial requirements of the township, including payment of the balance of any outstanding taxes, including penalties and interest be paid. Does anybody have any questions in regards to those conditions? No. And I just want to I, note that- Tracy, I have something to say. Okay. Um, the right of way or the easement onto Grouse Lane Grouse Lane is a private road not maintained by the township, is that correct? That's correct. So where does Grouse Lane join a maintained municipal road? So Grouse, it, so it's off of Macaulay Lake Road is Grouse Lane. I don't know if I'm... We're a, so what happens, I don't know if you can look Sandra at the, um, I don't know, Holly, could you go to one of the, um, the figure two of the report? This one, this one would be good too. This one. So this is what the layout will be. So as you can see, Grouse Laden comes in and kind of, um, these, these maps may not be to scale either, but it'll come in and then um, the easement will provide access. There was already a, a bit of a, a an easement there, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, or so, I'm not guessing. And then, so, so now this provides access because it's in a new lot being created, they need to get legal access. So they, or, they put this part in um, at the beginning. So then it, it, within that part, it's gonna provide legal access to all those properties. So as a township, we are allowing the severance to um, have its easement onto a privately maintained road, yes? Is that what That's I'm understanding? That's what we're proposing. So these, these lot, these, there's already existing dwellings on both these lots. So we're create, we're fixing mm -hmm. something that was done in the past. Um, right now, would this have happened currently if there was no existing development? Probably not um, because they don't access um, their frontage on a township maintained road. But since there were already existing development prior to the zoning bylaw, they're fixing what was what was done in the past, essentially. Um, okay. Okay. That's I know fine. moving moving forward, and if there wasn't those buildings are already there, my guess it wouldn't go through because it wouldn't be adhering to the official plan. Um, and an official plan amendment would have would be required. And at that, I don't know if it would have been. Um, um, 
approved either. Um, but it's it's there and this is fixing something that's already there and um, the planners feel that this is the, the right approach and um, and I do too. That's fine. <laughs> okay. That's fine. It makes a lot of sense. I, I just I just wanted it noted that that is the case. We're allowing a severed piece of land access onto a non-municipal uh, maintained road. Right, yep. Um, so is there any additional conditions or deletion of conditions the committee feels that should be taken out? Um, I just also wanna note that um, the applicants had already started some of these conditions um, per the first application. Um, they just resubmitted because it was resubmitting re re the application. We put them back in, but uh, like I know the they had provided confirmation already about the septic system. So that's something that can be already taken off, but we'll include it in there on this, um, this application as well. Is there anything else that anyone would like to add? I know uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick and Ms. Utley, you're online and um, this is, you can provide any comments if you wish. I only had one question, the notice of the last day for appealing the decision. Right, so that goes out um, when I send the notice of decisions out, it's 20 days after that. So it could be, you know, I'm hoping to get them out by the end of this week. If not, it'll be from the time moving forward for the appeal. All right, so that date of uh, the 8th of, okay. Um, that date will be included on the notice of decision. Um, and I will send that, I'll make sure I forward it to both applicants. It should be 2021 then? Uh, it would be 20 days after it goes out. So it should be the around middle of December. Oh, okay. Um, Tracy, if, if we, when we submit the um, zoning bylaw amendment application, how long is the period after the submission of that? So for the zoning bylaw amendment, that is, um, we need um, notice period as well, something similar to what we did in the consent. Um, it's a little longer period of time that we need to provide notice for 120 meters within the um, property. Um, and then it's a, a process as well. We have to wait so many days before we have a meeting and it goes to actually the council, um, not the committee. So it's, it's a bylaw, it has to be passed by the council. So that will be um, at a different meeting and that won't be till um, I would suspect February. Well, whenever the application is submitted, then we um, staff time and the planners time have to work on it and get the, the signs up and the notices out. Okay. I can um, speak to you after the meeting and send you the information. I have a, a great um, timeline that I can send you and it kind of gives you information on what it, what it entails. Okay. Okay. So with that uh, being said, I um, would look for a motion from the committee. Um, and to, um, on the decision as read by myself, um, can I have um, with the suggested conditions, does anybody have anything to add with the look at, I would look for uh, someone to uh, move it and second it. I'll move uh, the motion. I'll, I'll second it. All in favor. Okay, and all in favor? Yes. Carried, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks Tracy. Is there anything else? Um, so I think I would like to touch base on the two applications that were deferred um, for the public because they were um, within the uh, agenda when we first circulated it. And I think um, just to provide some information on where these applications are at. Um, the first one, 4.2, it was for consent application for severance um, on the GUI road. We deferred that meeting pending on additional before... information. Oh, sorry. Do you want to just let Jim and Lisa know that if they're they that their part is finished and if thank them? Oh, they don't need absolutely. They don't, Sorry about that. They don't need to sit through that. No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, for attending, and I will be in touch with the information. 
Okay. Thanks, Tracy. And thank, thank you. you. Everyone. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Sorry about that, Holly. Um, so I'm going to touch base with um, about the one on Magui Road. There was there's a bit of an access issue that came up during the process. So we requested additional information, and I believe there's some surveys that's going to be surfacing um, in regards to that. So once that we can get that straightened out, maybe we're looking maybe January, February, maybe uh, for another committee meeting. Um, for the second one on um, consent application um, 202003, up until yesterday, I thought that we were going to be um, including this in the, in the meeting and last minute uh, had to cancel it or defer it, I should say, um, to get more information pending a um, easement to an adjacent property owner. And uh, we may have to include that in, in the application. And then at that, then kind of similar to what Utley's was, we'd have to recirculate. So there's more information. I don't know for sure what's gonna happen with that one, but um, uh, more information is coming and I will you know, keep everybody updated and hopefully that can be on the table for January or February. So if the committee has any questions, um, answer those for you the best of my knowledge. Okay, Hearing thanks none. Tracy. Uh, I guess uh, the next meeting will be in, uh, 2021 and if there isn't anything else uh if we can get a mover to uh, adjourn the meeting the seconder i'll make the motion to adjourn moved by joe seconded by dave thank you very much thanks tracy appreciate it uh all your work and uh likely frustrating when things don't go as planned but uh anyway it happens. Out, of your, out of your control that's right. It happens. And it's better to delay than to um, do something that we shouldn't have, you know, that could have been fixed. So exactly. Are we ready to move on to the asset management committee meeting? I think we are, Joe. I'll just wait for the agenda to come up on the screen. Okay, uh, I'd like to call the the Asset Management Committee meeting to order at, uh, I don't know what time, 9.20, 9.15. And uh, are there any uh, additions or amendments to the agenda? Chair, it's uh, Councilor Vermeer. Um, I'm just wondering if we could add, and maybe it can come under new business under the 2021 capital projects, but the discussion of Shields Road on Aylan Lake. Okay, I'll write that in. Also, Joe, if, uh, are you finished, Joey? Yes. Uh, 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 thanks. Uh, also, um, I wonder under uh, capital projects also, we can uh, include Hay Lake in there. Hay Lake or Hay Lake Road? Hay Lake Road. Okay, anything else? Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I'll move it. Moved by Richard. I'll Can second it, Dean. Seconded by Mayor Dumas. With the matters before us today, does anybody wish to disclose a pecuniary interest? No. Are, are none noted? Is our uh, delegation present? Yes, I am present. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, Ron, I'll give you the floor and you can state your case or sure what i've done is i've uh i've uh, typed up a few pages of what i wanted to say so i'll just read it if that's all right yes sure 
Okay, I appreciate you guys uh, letting me have my voice here. Um, my name is Ron Milne. For you, those, uh, for you uh, those don't know who I am, I have two cottages on Cross Lake for, uh, across from the boat launch. I have owned property and paid taxes on this lake for 34 years. I've enjoyed many years of coming here, and I feel it is the best kept secret in Ontario cottage country. The people are amazing, the scenery is beautiful, but unfortunately, it is becoming less and less of a secret. Approximately 15 years ago, the township put in a dock at the boat launch against the will of a few of the cottagers that were situated in the same bay, mostly because of foresight to the problems we are facing. Since then, the South Algonquin area has become more and more busy due to a few factors. The Highway 407 is now connected to the Highway 115, giving cities west of Oshawa easier access to the Bancroft area by eliminating one to one and a half hours off their driving time because of the lack of traffic jams. Our immediate area has had increased traffic due to the upgrade of the Madawaska Road south of our township. The success of the Madawaska Lodge and the ever abundance of squatters on Bark Lake. The traffic at the boat launch has increased due to all of these factors. Another factor has increased the traffic on the lake is the fact that the lake was stocked with 6,000 lake trout yearlings over the past seven years, which is great for the lake, but the organization that stocked the lake also advertises it on the front page of the Bancroft Times and on their website. Needless to say, there has been a large increase of professional and semi-professional fishermen, as well as hobby fishermen coming onto the lake. There are about 52 cottages on the lake, and recently one of the properties severed off four new boat access lots, bringing the total boat access, boat access lots to eight. All of these property owners access their property via the boat launch, where they either launch their boats or they have a boat stored in the bush and they drag it out when they arrive. They use the dock to load and unload their boats and they park their vehicles and trailers at the launch area. There have been a number of problems arising from all these factors. I'll try my best to communicate these problems to you and paint the best possible picture that I can. I also have solutions to the existing problems and future problems that will most definitely arise in the future. Problem one, the traffic in our bay has increased exponentially in the last five years. The traffic is causing shoreline erosion from the waves, excess noise due to the constant traffic of ATVs, boat launchers, lodgers, campers, exploring tourists and partiers. Visiting boats introduced invasive vegetation that is slowly spreading out of the boat launch bay. Boat traffic eliminated the bullfrog and turtle population at the end of our bay due to the large waves and also decreased the population of loons that were prevalent on the lake. A lot of this traffic is from the lodge fishermen and the uh, squatters on Bark Lake. There was a man and a daughter who launched a sea dew. The man stood on the dock while the daughter was on the sea dew doing donuts. The father was screaming instructions to his daughter teaching her to drive the sea dew while she was in the middle of the bay learning how to drive it. This is just one example of the safety concerns we have. Second problem, the boat launch parking area has become overwhelmed with excess vehicles, which is an emergency vehicle route. There are eight boat access lots, potentially if all eight lot owners came at the same time, which will become more and more likely as they build cottages and homes, there could potentially be eight vehicles with trailers. Now, if you add in one additional vehicle for each boat access lot for a visitor to one of those cottages, and then X amount of vehicles for fishermen, visiting boaters, visiting boaters, and potential, there's potential for upwards of 25 to 30 vehicles with trailers. There's not enough room for that many vehicles and the air cannot be increased in size because it's on the side of a hill people will start cramming in vehicles and potentially blocking this emergency route. This past season, I witnessed 12 vehicles and trailers and an additional three vehicles, which were parked up the side of the road, which narrowed the access. I tried to drive over to visit a friend and turned around because I thought I might scrape a vehicle because the area was so tight. My big concern here is that an emergency access route that leads to half of the cottages on the lake 
and it runs through a jammed parking area with a lot of cottages on the road being in their golden years, there's campfires, there's excess or there's more watercraft and off-road vehicles. The potential for a problem with access in the case of an emergency increases every year. A few years ago, a young girl was thrown from an ATV without a helmet, was taken to Bancroft Hospital and then airlifted to Belleville because of seriousness of her injuries. Before that, emergency forest fire fighters came in to put out two fires caused by arsonists. I don't know if you guys remember that or not, that's a few years back, but they used the boat launch area to deploy the boats. The fire was before we had a dock. If an emergency is blocked or delayed due to lack of parking organization, and there's a financial loss or human loss, there will undoubtedly be some percentage of liability on the township, if not all of it. The third problem, the dock is not big enough to accommodate more than two boats. If two boat access owners leave their boats moored at the dock temporarily while they go to town or to the dump, there's not enough room for any other boat access owners to dock their boats. I have witnessed them waiting or turning around on a few occasions already. Fourth problem, boat access owners have to drag their boats out of the bush and put their motors on the dock every time they come to the lake. And then five owners have to drive two kilometers to the property in their boat. If eight boat access owners take seven trips or 14 <laughs> passes by the shoreline, that's a total of 112 trips, two kilometers long each way past the shores per weekend. Our bay, which is only 150 feet wide, cannot tolerate that much traffic, even if it was half of those many trips. This doesn't include everyone else who passes by in their boats during a weekend and usually at illegally high speeds. The problem five, despite the no camping signs, there are still campers at the launch. There are also a large number of fishermen, ATVers and tourists who use the dock for picnic and parties, swimming and dogs exercising at seven in the morning. I've witnessed people smoking weed, drinking alcohol and hopping into a vehicle and driving away with kids in their vehicle. We have a large party of ATVers this year with their children present who were drinking alcohol, smoking weed, urinating, and then topped it off with shooting off their shotgun. It was during hunting season. There were tenants, uh, they were tenants from the lodge. Problem number six, boat access owners use the launch area to build parts of their structures, like whether it be their house or their cottage or their dock, and then they float it from there and they transport it because of the dock that accommodates them. Problem number seven, there are very large fishing and pleasure boats being launched on the lake. I witnessed a cabin cruiser on the lake this year, as well as large houseboats, a houseboat attempting to go onto the lake. I think I sent pictures of that one. Our lake is not big enough for these types of boats. This year, we saw a professional fishing derby on our lake. There were five boats with 225 horsepower motors. They were obviously professional fishermen. The reason the boats have such large motors, in case you don't know, is so they can get uh, from one fishing spot to another as fast as they can to maximize their time with a fishing line in the water, which maximizes their time to catch fish. The more fish and the heavier the fish they catch, the more apt they are to win the prize money. These boats were flying around our lake 80 to, a 80 to 100 kilometers per hour all day. One of the boats took off from the launch at full speed, which was probably about 80 kilometers an hour by the time he reached the end of the bay. With people swimming in this area, sometimes they swim across the bay. I can hear cottagers, owners screaming, slow down, you beep, beep. Uh, again, our lake and our bay is not big enough for this type of activity. They would not launch on our lake if the dock were removed because of fear of damaging their boats, which leads me to my solutions. The solution I have to these problems are either free or very low cost to the township. I propose to remove the dock and the ground attachment indefinitely. Cottage owners on the lake launch their boats by putting a driver in the vehicle and another driver in the boat. The boat is entered into the water on a trailer. The boat driver starts the boat and drives to their cottage. The vehicle driver pulls the trailer out of the lake and drives to their cottage. They have no need for a dock. When they pull their boat out of the water, they just do the opposite. Or when they pull their boat out of the water, they just do the opposite. And there's still no need for the dock. The oldest resident on the lake with the largest pontoon boat on the lake took his boat out of the water with without a dock on Thanksgiving this year. 
The launch without a dock will not be convenient for large fishing boats or large pleasure boats, but it still can be used for small fishing boats. If you put a yacht lift at the launch, people will launch yachts. If you don't put a yacht lift in, people won't launch yachts solely because it's not convenient. We're excluding yacht owners, and I propose we exclude large boat owners as well. People love convenience. The larger fishing boats can now drive down the road five kilometers and launch at Bark Lake, La Bark Lake Launch, which would now be a lot more convenient. A lot of the traffic would be redirected to Bark Lake, which is much larger and less populated. It would now be more convenient to launch there, and there are no permanent or seasonal homes nearby. This would reduce the traffic on our lake substantially, but not completely, and it would still be a public access lake. A new problem will arise for the boat access properties without public dock. The solution I have for that is to allow three boat slips and three parking spots at the launch for the three island boat access lots. These would be their own personal docks and personal parking spots. All other parking for the visitors and people launching their boats who are not from Lyle Lake or from the lake will park at the landing close to the Madawaska Road where it can be organized. It is a large area and it won't impede emergency vehicles. The three boat access slips will allow the island lot owners to moor their boats while they are going to town or to the dump or leave it there until their next visit. This leaves five remaining boat access lot owners. These lots have 66 foot road allowance exiting off Madawaska Road that leads to the 66 foot lake shoreline road allowance. There are still log cribs in the lake there from a dock from a boat access cottage from years ago. These road allowances are owned by the municipality. If you allow the boat access lot owners to build slips there, they will also be able to move their boats at will and also reduce their trips back and forth by 1.5 kilometers each pass or three kilometers each trip. Instead of a trip taking 10 minutes, it will take two minutes. This will reduce shoreline erosion significantly and will allow the wildlife at the end of the bay to repopulate. Boat access owners can park their vehicles on 66 foot road allowance and, the, and solve their parking problem, as well as reducing their travel time. Each lot owner will be responsible for the construction and maintenance of their own slips. I know there are potential problems if these changes are, were executed, but I have anticipated a few and I have solutions to those as well. The launch area would be laid out with landscaping to appear as though it was a roadway all the way through and appearance of no parking areas. There would be no room for any parking other than the boat access by permit only and the parking area at the entrance area of the Madawaska Road. This would eliminate the camping problem as well. There would not be anywhere to camp except for the top of the road, which they wouldn't want to do because there's no water. Most bylaws that I have seen need a minimum of 20 feet for access for emergency vehicles. If people park on the side of the road or on a fire route, there needs to be enforcement by fines or towing and that is revenue to help cover the cost of the bylaw officer. Signs simply do not work unless there's enforcement. The township costs would be signage and maybe a little bit of grading. This year, the dock was removed from the lake before Thanksgiving weekend. We watched two fishing boats with large motors on Thanksgiving weekend look at the launch and leave because there wasn't a dock in place and they didn't want to risk damaging their boat. Small fishing boats and canoes can be loaded right off the shore and pushed away. We watched three small fishing boats and two canoes do that on the Thanksgiving weekend. This past weekend, I witnessed three vehicles pull up at the boat launch after dark and all three vehicles pointed their headlights toward the water where the launch ramp is, is so they could see the launch. I could plainly hear them talking once they exited their vehicles because the sound carries. They were discussing the advantages of the launch to the Madawaska Lodge, which is for sale. I deducted that they were potential buyers and the lake is part of their marketing plan for the water access. Our lake has public access, but it should not be treated or allowed to be treated as a tourist attraction. It's not fair to the people on the lake who pay property taxes to support the township. We are not trying to take away public access to the lake. We are just trying to change the demographic of its users. These are my solutions to the ongoing problems, but I'm sure there are a number of solutions that are possible and we would welcome any one of them if it can help solve these ongoing problems. I have sent pictures of the areas in question as well as pictures of parties and boat lineups for the launch. If you are not clear 
what the overhead map and satellite pictures demonstrate, I can elaborate more, but they basically show the areas for the slips, the parking areas and the travel routes before and after proposed changes. If you have any questions or need to expand on anything else, let me know. I will uh, forward this uh, document as well for you guys if you want to review it uh, to Tracy and she can uh, distribute it from there. So that's all I have on that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Milne. As you can see by our agenda, uh, boat launches and uh, docking is a problem on a lot of the lakes in our township, uh, aside from Lyle. Uh, as far as the enforcement problems that you've come up with, those are all MNRF or OPP problems, really have nothing to do with the township, like the size of the waves on the lake and any of the infractions that don't occur at the landing. Does anybody have any questions or anything they would like Mr. Milne to clarify before we move on? Can I make um, a couple I... comments? Go ahead, Councillor Harper. Yes, um, Ron, what you speak of isn't just unique to Lyell Lake. This has happened in almost every boat launch within the municipality this year. Um, never have we ever seen the traffic on our lakes or the usage of our public boat launching ramps. And that's what they are, public boat launching ramps. I can't see the municipality, at least in my particular case, restricting them to certain individuals who are allowed to use them. They are public funded boat launching ramps to be used by the public, um, whether it's the people on the lake or a person that comes in from outside this area and wants to look at the lake from a boat. Um, these problems have been there for years and years. Long time, when I was working for the Ministry of Natural Resources, four years ago, there were problems at Lyle Lake. They were never going to be solved, and they haven't been solved to this day. So that's all I've got well, to say. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, like I said, I've been there for 34 years, and, and I'm right across from the launch. It's only been the last five years that I've really noticed a problem. And I don't think we're eliminating, or, or we are already eliminating people. We're, we're eliminating boats that can't get into that water. They're already eliminated, naturally. And all I'm saying is by taking out the dock, you're going to naturally eliminate another size of boat, which is the medium to big size of boat, right? And, okay, and by eliminating, and you're not eliminating, me. they can still do it, but they won't because it's not easy. Okay, I heard one other councillor uh, speaking up. I'm not sure who, which one it was. I'd like it, to make a was, comment. It was I me, Councillor so. Florent. Okay, uh, Councillor Collins first, and then Councillor Shaw. Uh, Go ahead. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Mill. Um, I have been, I I have been um, trying to uh, to put simple things in into plan ever since I've been your councillor and. Uh, as you said, the signs don't appear to be working. Um, the unfortunate thing is with regards to the speed and the waves and the erosion, it is only the OPP that can actually um, deal with this. And I think maybe a request into the <coughs> OPP because they have an officer right the way through um, the whole from I think May through to October, who is actually every weekend out there on some of the waterways. So I think a request to come in um, to actually, to, to actually police, if you like, the water for speed may well be something that we can, you can put in play um, for next year. Because I think the, the regulation says that if you are within a hundred meters of the shore, then your speed has to be reduced to X. And I think it's 10 kilometers an hour. Um, so I think the OPP could be approached and I think that they are the people that could maybe control some of the speed um, on the lake. Um, I, I don't think I can add anything extra to what you've said apart from that. But thank okay. you well, for the delegation. Okay, thank you, Councillor Collins. Uh, Councillor Shallow, you wanted to speak? Yeah, Mr. Milne, I, uh, I start taking notes as you were speaking and... Uh, I really think that, uh, and I appreciate you offering to forward this to Tracy uh, or, or to Holly and then it being forwarded on to us. And 
possibly we can relook at it again at a, prior to a to a meeting where we can make our comments and uh, I have comments um, that I'd like but I won't make them here and I won't delay the process any longer as Joe mentioned we have a busy day ahead of us and so I will uh, I'll wait till we receive this in hard copy and then I'll make my notes and we can discuss as a, a council uh, further down the road and uh, go from there okay can I clarify one thing go ahead um, the one thing I wanted to clarify is it's it's always been a public launch and it always will be a public launch and we're not stopping anyone from launching there. But it's like a public road. If people speed on a public road, you can do things to slow them down by putting in speed bumps, putting in four-way stops, that sort of thing. It's still a public road, but it's going to slow people down from speeding. And what I'm saying is, if you take away the dock, it's kind of like a speed bump. All of a sudden, you're going to have certain types of boat that won't want to launch there. If they do want to launch there, they can get a smaller boat with a small motor, and they can still launch there. Or they can launch their bigger boat. But it's just not as convenient. And the same is, same is for the parking. If you, if, you, uh, if you change the parking to the top of the hill, less people are going to want to use it, and it's going to promote Bark Lake where you I guess you're putting money into Bark Lake to improve the uh, the boat launch there. That's that's my whole point basically. It solves a lot of problems that are going to arise by by removing that launch, giving the boat access people um, uh, their own slips, which most lakes have that as far as I know. Maybe not in South Algonquin, but I have friends that have boat access and they have their own slips. They pay the ministry a small fee every year or whatever and and they can leave their boat there. It's better for I think, them. I think you're talking about a private marina, and I don't think you would condone a marina being built on, on Lyle Lake. No, no, not a marina. No, no, it's it's it's. Well, that's uh, the only place where land. you can have private slips. Okay, we're going to move on anyway. We have we're going to have a lot of discussion in the next few months on uh, all boat launches and and parking lots as well. It's uh, one thing we're all in agreement that it is an ongoing problem. Uh, and it's not specific to, to the Lyle Lake book launch. But if you could go ahead and uh, forward the rest of that material, and then it would be distributed to the councils and uh, the councillors, and maybe uh, we'll have further discussion at some other time. Okay, okay. that's great. Okay, if, if I can move on to uh, unfinished business now, and surprise, surprise, first thing is the Yale Lake boat launch and storage area. Uh, does somebody have a report? I have a bit of an update. Um, unfortunately, I haven't heard back from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Bancroft yet. I re-emailed them this morning just to uh, remind them. Excuse me, Dave? Short... Pardon? Could you identify yourself, Dave, for the people oh, watching? Yeah, sorry, you? it's Dave Gatley here, Public Works Superintendent. Um, and uh, I did have a conversation with uh, the consultant that did the testing at that site uh, during its uh, decommissioning. And they didn't foresee any environmental issues or issues with the wells or using it for uh, trailer storage. So uh, anyway, that, that's all we have at this point. I'm still hoping to hear from the Minister of Natural Resources before the end of the year. Okay, does anybody else have anything to uh that they would wish to add to the Ellen Lake boat launch storage area? If not, we can move on to the strategic plan discussion. I think that's you, Holly. Yeah, I think as, as everyone knows, I put a staff report in the council package and it was deferred to this meeting. So if you guys have questions or want to discuss it, um, I can bring that council or staff report up if you like or if you just wanted to does anybody I'll, have anything uh, i can i can make a comment if uh if it's okay i guess when i look at number four recreation and culture and it talk talks <clears throat> about create ways to attract more visitors and we just discussed how we want to possibly keep people away from a location so and if we haven't been working at that on our own we've certainly been as Councillor Harper mentioned, um, 
the people are coming, whether it's because of COVID, but it's, I think, just uh, possibly a generation that's uh, deciding that they're going to use public, public uh, or crown land or whatever is available to them. So uh, they're certainly showing up here anyway every weekend throughout the township and I guess throughout the province. So. <coughs> I, th I think the discussion was specific to whether or not we want to do a start a strategic plan in 2021 budget or if we want to defer that until after the election. I think that was, um, I can bring that up if you want. Does anybody have any uh, feelings on whether they want to uh, start the official plan in this term or wait until after the next election, which would be two years from now. The strategic plan, not the official plan. There, is, right. some there is some discussion happening. We are um, probably going to provide some recommendations on the official plan because of the changes that are happening with the land claim. So that's probably a good um, segue into this conversation. Um, it's very likely that we're probably going to propose updates to our official plan in the very near future in order to prepare for some of the work that the Algonquins are doing. So um, that's another part of it. Gary, mm -hmm. if I may, uh, uh, or Holly, uh, whoever wants to, the question or the comment, I guess if you look at, and possibly I made this comment earlier, uh, if we, at an earlier meeting, if we leave it for a new council, it's we're putting a lot of work on a new council that maybe that's going to have to grasp a lot of things in a hurry. However, if we start jump started it uh, and not finalized it, then what it would do is it would uh, certainly, I think, assist. And based on our past experience as councillors, what we've seen and and developed, so I it may be more advantageous, maybe maybe for a new council if we started it. I don't know. I think that's just going to cause more work for staff if we start a strategic plan with this council and a new council comes in and it's not finished. We're just going to rewrite it. Okay, well, just that's my comment. Yes, Jane. <clears throat> Um, I thank staff for this report, and I think um, I think in my mind, I think it would be better if we left it for the incoming council. Um, I, I think uh, if we have work that we have to do on the official plan, I think that uh, that will have to get done. And then I think it would lead at least provide a document, maybe transitioning into new members coming on council or whatever, and then go into the official plan. And I certainly like the uh, through Holly's report that she provided at uh, our, our previous meeting, I like the very much um, more compact plan. As this indicates, I think there were 131 action items or something in our plan, and it was a good plan at the time. And it was like a catch up because we hadn't had one. So personally, I think I would prefer, uh, in my mind, I would prefer to leave the 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 um, the, uh, sorry, the strategic plan for the incoming council. I mean, what better way to get a review of what's available currently in the township and then to make the plans for, you know, the next 10 years or whatever. I think by jumpstarting it, um, um, I just, I think it should be the, the, the work of the incoming council. Thank you. I think I uh, tend to agree with the statement by the mayor. Uh, the only thing is that uh, when it's mentioned in your report here, Holly, it's it kind of leads you to think that it's going to start in 2022, but it actually probably wouldn't start until 2023 because the election is in late in the fall in 2022. So it's not just around the corner. It's probably be over two years from now. Does anyone have anything else there? Wish to if, I, if I may chair, it's Jane. I think also we've got, you know, this council has done a lot of, of great work and we've got some, uh, some things that we may be able to wrap up 
two, you know, in the next two years of this council so that uh, we would have projects completed or initiatives completed and then go forward. As you say, it would be in uh, the incoming council in 223. Yes. Thanks. Okay, if nobody else has anything to add to that, can we move on to the proposed signage plan? And there is a staff report included with that. And I will give you the floor again, Holly. Um, yep. <clears throat> yeah, so pretty to the point, um, staff report the outline is those are the signs that we have existing and those are the one the locations that we're proposing i just wanted to put it in front of council to make sure everyone is aware of the priorities and and what is being planned to be done and uh, i did include a, a um, an example at the end i guess i didn't clearly articulate that those two examples are are for shape um, so I don't know if council wants more information than this or less, or if you just want to have a general discussion about it and give staff some feedback. Um, just to remind you, this is a project that was budgeted um, and there was a, a rural economic development grant provided for it. So this is funding that is in the 2020 budget that will be moved into the 2021 budget as we finish this project. I just, uh, a couple of comments, uh, the, uh, the inclusion of the uh, ball diamond and the boat launch, I think, is a good thing. It wasn't on the old signs. Uh, I understand that you want to change the location of the sign. I'm not really in favor of uh, removing the event sign, if that was the, the plan. Uh, we fought long and hard to get that event sign moved down from the other hall to, to this hall. And I know any time that there is an event there, the feel that the event sign is very important because we're not right on the highway and uh, but you could see you can see the event sign from the highway beside the event sign sure I can go along with that one and, and that's instead of being tucked right in tight to the building where the president sign is that's the only comments I have I think the more information you have on the signs the better unless it comes to a point where everything is cluttered. Yeah, and I think that um, if you look at, um, for example, uh, I guess the, the Gale Area Lake boat launch, I think most of, our, most of our locations have all of these additional signs. So the intention is to kind of create one focus area that will include all of those underneath it or try to clean it up a little bit instead of having, you know, posts everywhere. Um, so uh, as we go forward with the boat launch signs, you know, the goal will be boat launches and beaches, the same will be, you know, these are our bylaws. These are the things that apply to these areas and, and kind of come up with one standardized method to say all of those things. Um, and we had talked about kind of saying them, you know, in a more positive way, instead of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. We could maybe make it a bit more wordy. Um, but those are kind of the next steps, I guess. If I may. Some of the areas do get cluttered after a while by adding signs as different problems arise. Uh, Jane, I seen your hand up. Um, I, I like the signs on the, I'm looking at the one, <clears throat> excuse me, for the public works garage in Madawaska. And I think, <clears throat> sorry, I guess I'm not talking enough. I've got um, a grumbly voice here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I, I, I give kudos to um, to Dave and staff in the works department at how neat and tidy that area that I find it very neat and tidy every time I drive by the um, works yard in Madawaska. And I certainly feel that those signs on the end of the buildings, again, just start to tune people into the fact as they drive into Whitney, either from, you know, the Bancroft area, the Madawaska area, or for coming out through Algonquin Park, that they are now in South Algonquin. And uh, as I say, I really do like those signs on the, the larger, our larger buildings. So, and, and I do, I, I agree with you, Joe, um, Councillor Florent, that the, the, the cohesiveness of the information on the signs in one spot are, are really very good. And that will go with our, you know, people being able to find things as well, too. So those are my comments in regards to the signs. Thank you. I have a yes, question. Councillor Shala and then Bongo. 
Yes. When we're putting up the signs, if we could pull up the Gay Larry Lake one, actually it's in front of us now, where the posts are. And then I noticed the one at the township office where they're recessed in behind the sign. And then I just think if we can, uh, there's about three of them. And then there's one in Madawaska. Yeah, that one in Madawaska. Like the post really doesn't mean anything. So if it was trimmed off, but it, with inside, inside of that square, uh, I just think it would just, the, it's not the post we want to see. We want to see the sign. And yeah, like in that, in the bottom yes. case there where they're hidden, I just think we could have them all maybe more uniform. And uh, I, uh, the one certainly at the township office in relation to the one at uh, Memorial Park, there's quite a difference. And, uh, but if that was, whoever was installing those when the time comes, I think we could improve it. And, and then when we're talking about the signs and we didn't have the ones on the highway, um, the one at uh, the east end of the township, down uh, towards Barry's Bay on Highway 60, it's up quite high and it really stands out. The one to where, down by Lake St. Peter appears to be much lower ground. So when the weeds are growing and the brush is growing, it just doesn't, it just seems too low. And then, and then you look at, in that particular area, you look at the one across the road, Hastings Highlands, mm -hmm. theirs stands right out and it's up much higher. I just think we should uh, fine tune some of that. And that's my comments. Councilor Bongo. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess we uh, we spent time on the branding plan exactly for this reason. So um, I'm if, if there's any comments coming from me, I'm hoping that uh, our signs uh, follow the style guide th that the designer uh, sent us. So that includes using the suggested color palette and of course the fonts as well. Uh, the typeface of all of the text. Um, if if it's all streamlined all across the township, I think that really strengthens our brand. Um, and, and then I do have a, a question for Holly, and that's um, uh, those uh, wayfinding maps, uh, are those included with this sign initiative? Yeah, and I guess they're very close to being done. We haven't really received any more comment. There is, um, there is a paper copy on the uh, table in the council chambers, and I had asked... Um, if, if any other members of council wanted to review that. Um, I think the original uh, intention was that one of those was going to go in J.R. Booth Park and one in um, in Gallery Lake Memorial Park. I don't know if council has any suggestions on other locations that we could put them. Um, I know other municipalities put them on the side of buildings. We could maybe make a version that we could stick on the side of our outhouses. I don't know what uh, what council thinks. Um, I know that's not a great location, but in some of our, you know, some of our boat launch areas, I'm thinking Ale and Lake boat launch, they probably don't want more signage um, such as that, but maybe, you know, maybe that is something that um, those, those residents would like to know where the map of the rest of the municipality. So I will leave that to council. Um, I think right now we're intending that there, there are two locations for that and, and you can let me know. Sure, absolutely. Uh, as you said, uh, one of those maps at Galeri Lake Memorial Park, I think that's a pretty obvious choice. Um, and then as for JR Booth, if, if that's the best central downtown location for Madawaska, personally, I, I think that's great. Um, or, or if any other councillors have a different uh, location for the map in Madawaska. Um, I was wondering, Holly, if, if at all you could make available to us, I don't know if you have like a digital version of the map. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we put the, we passed the digital version around for a long time and then we decided that it was too difficult to read. So we start, we printed it. Um, I can, I can redistribute another digital version if you like. Uh, sure. If you just want to email me one, uh, I'm, I'm meeting with uh, the, um, the business association later this week. So I'll just share that with them. Uh, they've asked me a lot uh, about uh, how that's coming along. So I'll just send them the draft. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Councillor Shala. Uh, Holly, uh, a large sign like that would 
uh, say, for example, at uh, the Memorial Park, would it be along that road um, where the, the privies are on that side of the road so it doesn't take away from the park? I mean, it's entirely up to council. I thought maybe we could we could use the two sets of six by sixes that are there and put that larger sign on there where the, where the, the um, accessibility trail sign that you don't like is, we could put that other one up there. Or like I said, we could put them on the sides of buildings, I want maybe at the beach houses. Um, it, I don't know, you tell me. Uh, as long as it isn't in the front of uh, where the flower boxes are at the front, if it's at the back, it would, I guess it would be fine. Councillor Collins, I think I heard you. Yes, um, thank you. I, I think by us putting that signage map in the JR Booth Park, we're not um, advertising very widely. We need, I think, that sign to be on the trails, on the ATV trail, the snowmobile trail are accessible and, and the park is not accessible to those people. So I think that sign either an additional um, sign or, or to move that to, to the community center area, I think is the better location for the one in Madawaska, most definitely. Any other comments? I uh, yeah. oh. Councillor Harper? Uh, just one comment, Councillor Florent. Um, I have a suggestion on how to reduce the clutter of signs within a municipality and that is to remove all signs with the, let, the word no in them. Um, they don't do what they're supposed to, and no isn't a very friendly word. <laughs> Was there somebody else trying to make a comment? Yes, Councillor Florent, it's me, um, yes. Jane. Um, I, I, I appreciate, appreciate what Councillor Collins has said, but I think I noticed as I traveled to, to Madawaska recently, that they have cleared the pines in front of, uh, or the shrubbery that was in front of the area at the JR Booth Park. And I think that's actually probably the best place for the sign. Uh, it's clear, it's very visible from the highway. I, I don't know how we would position it. Maybe, maybe we need a sign on both sides for coming and going. But um, I think to, to I think we've got a Madawaska complex sign, but I think uh, we should have something there at that area of JR Booth Park now that they've cleared it out a bit. I like it. I don't know what you think, Joe. It's it's it just is very visible. There's nothing that impedes your your vision of JR Booth Park now. That's true, uh, Mayor Dumas. It is a lot more open than it was before, but that also creates a problem with putting a s signage within the. Uh, the boundaries of Highway 60 because there are rules and laws governing signs that can be seen from the highway. So that's true. Uh, yeah, uh, that, there's a, quite a bit to be taken into consideration there. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Shala. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Collins had a good point. And also, uh, and, and um, the clerk, um, she talked about posting them possibly at washrooms. But the, there's a lot of traffic coming here by snowmobile, ATV, whatever way. So if we could have a, a reduced version of it, I'm not talking about the wording, but just more of a compressed sign at, at certain junctions, strategic junctions of these trails that are leading into our township, mm -hmm. um, Lake St. Peter area, so, uh, Ale Lake area, then if people want to stop and look at it and then give them an idea of what's there and uh, where to go. And uh, I think it would be helpful. Councillor. Yes, Tony. Um, I just want to say, I feel like there's some scope creep happening here. This, the intention of this was to put this sign in two locations. And now we're talking about at junctions and on snowmobile trails, maybe that's something that could be phase two of this. I think the intention is to get signage at all of, our locations, all of our beaches and our boat launches. And if we could do that, then maybe once we get beyond that, we could look next year at these additional good ideas. True. Any other comments? Well, we, you, you mentioned outhouses, if I may. You mentioned outhouses. We certainly have a lot of them. and uh, But we only have a few uh, 
uh, accesses into the township on these recognized trails. So uh, I don't think it would be that expensive or that timely. Uh, so just to be clear, when I was mentioning outhouses, I was mentioning outhouses in these locations that we were already talking about. So I was thinking about not, not adding clutter, but like, so for example, I was thinking maybe on the side of the beach house mm -hmm. at JR Booth Park, or I don't know if it's appropriate to put one on the side of the outhouse at Memorial Lake Park, but I think I was speaking to your point of not adding more clutter, more things. Uh, Gallery Lake Memorial Park is getting pretty cluttered. So, um, I would, uh, I'm not too much in favor of, of putting the signs on the outhouses, but uh, mm -hmm. anywhere but. Okay. Okay, Councillor uh, Bongo brought up about uh, keeping in uh, tune or in line with the recommendations regarding the color and the signage. I'm glad that that was on the page right now. It shows an example of our old sign from the municipal office and the new sign. I think the old sign is much more friendly looking than the new one. Mm, I don't. It's nice, warm, South Algonquin colors as opposed to something that may be inviting you to a sideshow. Not my feelings. Okay. okay, but it is mine. Yes. No. Again, it, it's uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, and if anybody, if nobody <laughs> has anything else to add to the proposed signage plan, <laughs> can uh, I guess can move I, on. I just want to clarify. Uh, so we're ordering two large community maps to be put in JR Booth, is that where we went? JR Booth and Gallier Lake Memorial Park, there will be two and we'll determine the, the exact locations later. Is that mm -hmm. the direction think, I'm getting? I think you're gonna to have to work with Ministry of Transportation on location of those signs in, in both of those parks. Because I seriously of the, think, I don't, Dave, do you wanna ring in on that? Isn't it within the road allowance? Um, in the case of JR Booth Park, where the JR Booth Park sign is, that's within their permitted area. And where our historical boards are, they're outside of it. So there, there is a line there um, just past the washroom and the change room. It would be a permitted area. And then in Galeria, I've never measured it, but I would think it would be somewhere around where the planter boxes are, would be the permitted limit. Mm -hmm. So do we want to change and decide that we're putting one at the at the community hall instead? I personally think that that's the best place for it. Okay. Councillor Shally, you had another comment? Uh, yes, if we're, to, uh, it certainly sounds like we're moving forward with two large signs. Uh, are yeah. we going to discuss which one of these um, shapes we're we prefer the one on the right or the one on the left where it's talking about Madawaska complex or um, mm -hmm. it's up there for a reason there. If we we're going to discuss it and we're going to move forward and in order to give you uh, authorization, Ollie, you should know council should approve what you, what we want. And, and if that's what it's there for, um, we should be deciding maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Except that the design, uh, that design, wouldn't necessarily be same for those, the two signs that we're talking about, the information signs, right? Well, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Is that what you're suggesting, Holly, is that we use the same design for all of the signs, even those ones, the, the two information signs? No, the information signs are completely different. I'm just asking. So they're just going to be four by eight square signs as the printout okay. is on the, the council table. I'm just asking if we're ordering two and if you're deciding if it's going in JR Booth Park or at the community hall. And I, I think it seems like we've, we've said that the other one is going at Gallery Lake Memorial Park. 
Okay, now I'm confused. We're talking about the map signs, Holly, the four so, by eight the map signs. So what was provided in the package was a, a signage plan where I'm proposing all of the signs as are on the screen right now will be will be put. And then further into that conversation, Bongo brought up the community sign. So those are those are completed. We've gone back and forth with, with them a bunch of times. They'll be put on four by eight and there will be two of them. My recollection was that we, they were going in JR Booth and Gail Airy Lake, but this discussion has maybe indicated that it should go at the community center instead. So maybe um, we could put some stakes out that indicate plowing and where they should go. We'll order two of those big signs and then um, these are all going to need to be located at every location. So maybe staff and uh, the snowplow guys can figure out what the best locations are. We could put some stakes out and then have that discussion later on. I think we're confirming we're only ordering two is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Holly, uh, if I may, yes. or through the chair, if I may just clarify, we can still put signs within the MTO permitted area. We just have to apply for the permit. I think there's an annual fee, isn't there, Dave? No, it's a one time. Or is that fee. just highway signs? Uh, it's just a one time fee for signs in our parks within the permitted area. It's based okay. on square footage. Okay. Uh, can I make a point about the signs at the Madawaska complex? If you're putting the, that information uh, uh, sign there for the benefit of snowmobilers and the snowmobilers can't access 90% of the points that are going to be on that because it's not on the snowmobile trail and the same with the four by four access. I think it's uh, much better to be at the JR Booth Park where it's accessed by vehicle traffic as opposed to four wheelers and snow machines. Maybe an additional sign at some point uh, at, uh, along the snowmobile trail would, would be warranted, but not these signs. Um, if I may speak. Go ahead. Um, is there an option to simply have two signs? I don't know if that's too much. One at the complex uh, that is easily seen by the riders, both on ATVs and snowmobiles, and then perhaps one at JR Booth Park. I'm not sure if that's in the budget or not, um, but uh, I don't know if if that's if anybody has any comments about that. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, like I, I do want to feel that that uh, Madawaska downtown is being supported by council. So personally, as long as it fits in the budget, um, having a sign both for the ATVers and one for the people visiting the park or driving by the park, I personally don't see any problem with that. Um, again, with the idea of supporting downtown Madawaska, as long as it does fit in the budget. Anybody else have anything to add? I do. I'm just I'm Ed. certainly confused now. Uh, if we put a, the sign up at Madawaska at the, at the complex, it's telling you what you have there to offer. Are we, the signs that I thought Holly was talking about and putting at the two locations are the wayfinding signs. Am I wrong? Which one are we actually talking about putting up? Because there's no, certainly not much point in putting up the um, uh, we want to we don't want to clutter the place up with two or three signs. So we'd cert I would think we'd want to, and if it's at the Madawaska complex, you would try to I would think put it all on one sign or organize it so that um, in a manner that would sort of reduce all the clutter. And I think that's what we want to do. So are we talking about putting up the, way, the wayfinding sign at the uh, Gailary Lake Park and also at um, uh, J.R. Booth Park? Are we, what are we really, which one are we talking about? Like, I think we're talking about the wayfinding signs 
and you have a point about uh, uh, clutter, if we if we include an, another one at uh, the Madawaska complex, I think for now we're best to stay with the original plan and one at uh, the park in Whitney and one at the park in Madawaska. We can always change or add signs or, or add two or three of them around the township as time goes on. Uh, it's just, you know, we've got to come up with the money to fund them, but I don't see that as a major problem. Yeah. And, okay, if we can move on, we'd like somebody mentioned before, we have a lot of matters before us today. So we can move on to the uh, update on Victoria Lake Road. Yeah, um, so I had a meeting yesterday with MECP and uh, they um, they have provided us with a contract for uh, the, the roads that are within the non-operating parks. Um, I have gone back and made it really clear um, that the work that will be done will be done in, in alignment with our um, level of service bylaw. There won't be any additional or reduction of service within there. So as we have been, um, they have confirmed to me that the culvert is going to go in um, this winter. I indicated to them that, you know, the problem that we're having is that we, the, the engineer has said we can't travel, we can't take our vehicles across that culvert. So it's impeding our progress or our ability to maintain the road beyond there. Um, so I'm hoping to have something um, in the next week or so that is finalized that I will send to a lawyer to review on our behalf. Um, further to that, the Camp Madawaska um, has offered to provide us with um, $2,500, their contribution to maintaining that road. Um, so we had said that in 2016, when I got here, that there was about $18,000 of what we thought was maintenance done on that section of road um, per year. So they're, they're offering that contribution as an, as a, um, um, kind of a team building or relationship building um, between us and Clancy Township. Um, I think that council needs to um, make the decision once we have that agreement um, on what the maintenance beyond that culvert will continue to be. Um, and I think they, they have said that if we decide to not plow it and we're willing to, um, th they would probably take over that um, that service themselves. Um, so that's where we are right now. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or if I'm forgetting anything. I when you're just like to point out, there's may. approximately four kilometers of, of road beyond that culvert, beyond the boundary of the Madawaska River Park, there's about four kilometers of, of township road that hasn't seen a greater in over two years now. Yeah, and I think that the, the reason is that culvert, is it not? I hope it's the only reason. Mm -hmm. So I think further to that, we do have some, um, We, as everyone's aware, there's a, a flurry of real estate changing hands in the municipality. And there are some, some properties in that area that are considering development or considering um, there's some activity happening in there. So that kind of furthers this conversation to say that although um, there hasn't been much res residential use at t until now, um, it's very likely that in the near future there will be. Yes. Anybody else have anything to add on the Victoria Lake Road? Uh, I have a Shaw. comment. Yes, uh, Holly, you mentioned you're going to have an agreement with uh, and send it to the lawyer. Is that also going to include the other areas in the township that have uh, where the road is within the parks, such as that's right. Road? Yes, it's it, yeah, it's an it's it's called a non-operating park um, road maintenance agreement. And just further to that, um, the uh, MECP has confirmed that the infrastructure within the, those um, parks is theirs and they're 
work, they're putting it in their uh, asset management plan. They, the AFA is, is taking over the inspection of those bridges. Um, so they're, they're taking it over the capital with the hope that we'll be able to continue the operations. As I said, it's, I will get our lawyer to review it. I've just got it to the point where I think I'm comfortable with I'll be honest, uh, the, the first iterations of the agreement was a lot of we're going to do what they what things to their standard. And I've continued to go back and say, no, we're going to do this in in line with our level of service bylaw. We're going to do the things that we do on every other municipal road. So that's kind of been my stance. Um, and uh, something else. Yeah. So, yes, going back, it is all of those roads. OK, thank you. I'm glad to hear that there's uh, at least having discussions on it. It's been at a standstill for far too long. I appreciate yeah, the work, well, Holly. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Can we move on to uh, number six, new business? And uh, the first item is the status of the 2020 capital projects. I would imagine that's you, Dave. Is uh, would you like to bring up that PowerPoint presentation? Holly? Yeah, just I will. It, it just might take me a second, Dave. Uh, my brain is switching gears here. Okay. Well, that's uh, happening. I just like to uh, bring you up to date on the road projects. We had, did finish them sort of in the end of October and uh, they came in actually below budgetary allowances, which was was good news. Uh, we're carrying on with uh, some drainage improvements still as weather allows uh, and uh, we still have some uh, outstanding uh, engineering proposals to get out some requests for proposals for the uh, road needs study and uh, the design of McCray Hay Lake Road. Yep, it's up now. If we can just look at the uh, slide with the, uh, yeah. The, you want, one. next slide. So, so, okay. Unless you want to go through these these items first, I don't feel, yeah. So that's the status of the, uh, the road projects. Um, I've allowed for a few invoices we haven't seen yet in those numbers you're looking at. Uh, Paradise Road, actually, we did fairly well on it. Uh, we'd anticipated some uh, finding some worse ground conditions um, where some of the road had sunk. And uh, when we dug into it, we didn't. So there was some savings there. And there's still a, uh, a matter of the outstanding streetlight. Um, Hydro seems to be having a little trouble get, getting us a quote and uh, they had a hard time getting there. I don't know if it was had to do something with COVID, but for some reason it got transferred to Timmins. And uh, anyway, they're still struggling with that, but that probably represents about 20,000 in cost. Uh, it's it's going to be a fairly expensive streetlight. Just anticipated and uh, yeah, as, uh, as when you look at the, uh, the road drainage, we didn't get started as early as I would have liked on some of it this year because we had budget delays, but uh, we are carrying on with some work, um, you know, as, as the weather allows. And we anticipate getting out the, uh, the engineering request proposals in December. We're still getting them in this year's budget. If you want to move on to the equipment or if there's any questions on any of that? Uh, the tender for the, the one ton truck is out now and we anticipate to have it back in uh, the second week of December. Unfortunately, there was a little delay getting that. Uh, and uh, you see that the, uh, the unplanned equipment expense uh, that we had the uh, float replaced in the beginning of the year. But that's basically where we're, where we're at with those. Dave, before you leave it, uh, it's okay, Joe. Uh, uh, 
you mentioned the the new truck. the The other truck. Are you going to keep it in service then for the winter? Well, I think you briefly mentioned that, and I'm just wondering. Uh, at this point in time, that's a very good question, Councillor Shawa. Um, we are still anticipating how to react to a positive COVID test in our midst. Uh, so at this point in time, we would like to keep it for this winter. Um, we may end up having to assign a man to a truck, depending on how things pan out here. The truck is in good shape and uh, it gives us a little more flexibility and then maybe reassess things in the spring. But uh, we, I had a, uh, a Zoom meeting with the, uh, the superintendents in Renfrew County and they are working on uh, various scenarios where their entire works department is quarantined and how they're going to deal with it. So we're obviously much smaller, but we, we can't lean on, uh, you know, other localities uh, within a county. So um, that's sort of part of our plan that we're putting together where we may just assign a man to a truck. And uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of where that's at. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any uh, questions? If I may, Councillor Florent, um, Dave, so the roads uh, need study and the traffic counts, et cetera, they will be going forward into next year then? That's correct. Uh, we had discussed it with the engineer trying to do a traffic count this year and they just thought it would be uh, not very representative. It's been a very strange year with traffic because we know that you know, our boat launches are very busy. It, it may not change in the spring, but... Um, yeah, they like to do them in the spring. Uh, it's a okay. better time of year, and, and uh, that's where the yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Shala. Yeah, uh, yeah, Dave. This roads need study. I've been, I put in likely mentioned the concern that came from the Mackenzie Lake area about a couple of quite sharp corners and how do we call them blind corners in that hill on the Pastoral Lake Road. Um, that catches everybody by surprise, not the local people, but any of the new, uh, anybody that's new in traveling in there. And we've been saying, well, we can't do this until the needs study. And this is like three years. So this will be, you'll be um, putting your tender out now so that, or if we are, if it's not going to get done, is it possibly that we could look at a cup, we could look at a couple of these car uh, locations. I think there's three of them for sure. And, um, it may just prevent an accident if the signs were put up ahead of time. It's so obviously we're going to need them. If it's a matter of a few signs, we can we can add some signs. You're talking about the curbs on North Mackenzie Lake Road. Uh, the one, yes, the one. Uh, I guess I was going to say by the old mine, but uh, the one before the very sharp ninety degree corner in there and then the one uh, where the snowmobile trail crosses just north of uh, South Mackenzie Lake Road. Yes. Where you're, there's a two or, couple, two or couple of bends, real sharp bends there. And there's actually been accidents there. And then uh, that hill on uh, just in there, oh, maybe four or 500 yards on Pasqua Lake Road from the sharp corner. Uh, I personally have had two close calls there and uh, not because I wasn't over, but because the people coming that were actually in there and had already experienced the road, but possibly forgot about it. And uh, I don't know what, maybe we could sit down sometime and sometime soon and uh, look at what type of signage would be appropriate. But I think we could maybe prevent an accident when one of those locations. We can certainly look at that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about the 2020 capital projects? If not, we can move on to the 2021 capital projects. And uh, I guess we could do uh, your discussion on Shields Road at this point, and then maybe come back to... Uh... Sure, sounds good. 
Uh, so I had a conversation with Superintendent Gatley um, regarding the township's obligation for the first 300 meters of Shields Road. And for those of you that may not be familiar with Shields Road, there's it's a class six right now with closed maintenance in the winter. And any maintenance for the summer, uh, not much has really been done because uh, there's no turnaround on the first 300 meters. Uh, right now we have four full-time property owners uh, that use Shields Road and possibly uh, two more coming. There's been a large investment in uh, property improvements uh, over the summer. And I'm just hoping council um, would be able to support me in changing bylaw 16512 to have the township uh, do a small capital project to have a uh, turnaround put in Shields Road. It wouldn't encompass the entire 300 meter section, but it certainly would help uh, because right now the private landowners are actually maintaining that portion of uh, Township Road. And uh, I'm just hoping to see this move forward uh, for next year that we could get that section uh, fully assumed uh, and the obligation of the Township um, come to fruition. I really don't know how to comment on that uh, other than it sounds to me like it's going to require some uh, further discussion. Uh, it's uh, you're, you're proposing that we improve that road enough that it receives winter maintenance. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, the, the first 300 meters, but where the turnaround and I've spoken with uh, uh, Superintendent Gatley about the location of a possible turnaround. It wouldn't encompass the entire 300 meter section of road. Uh, it's probably going to be around the 200 meter mark. And it would allow uh, the township to actually get their big trucks in so that it could be plowed that section and graded properly. And uh, they can turn around and then head back out to North Island Lake Road. So I guess the next step would be to, to have uh the work superintendent prepare a staff report so that all councillors would be on the same page and, and know what the discussion is about. Uh, okay, that's good. Okay, now uh, some, uh, I think it was Councillor Shallow on some discussion on Hay Lake Road. Yeah, I, uh, I think Dave has an, uh, answered the question and I think he talked about um, engineering drawings for Hay Lake Road. Is that correct, Dave? We have it in, in the budget uh, for 2021. Road. Pardon? Yeah. If we in 2021, uh, 2021 would be we would go out for engineering drawings if council approved that in the budget. Okay. Well, then I guess that's the first step. Okay. Thank you. But Joe, yes. while I'm uh, um, regarding the previous uh, Councillor Vermeer's request, I'm just uh, wondering if. Joe, would it be possible to drive in there now to have a look? Because I'm going to, if I'm going to vote on something in the middle of the winter, uh, maybe I would, could I check it? Now? Is it possible to get in there now to have a look at what I'm talking about? Because you're talking about, if I hear, heard you correctly, the parking lot being 200 meters in the road and then another, how is uh, the other 100 meters going to get maintained? Is I'm just trying to... Uh, Follow it's you. an access. It's an access road. There's no parking lot. Uh, uh, this is a road that's used to for uh, property owners to get to their property. But right now, the the 300 meters, which is under the township jurisdiction, has never been fully maintained. The property owners are actually maintaining that right now. They plow it. Uh, they grade it pretty much uh, all the time. And we're just looking to have the township itself uh, fulfill the obligation for their portion of that road. Okay. And yes, but I you, guess you, you can get in and have a look at it. Yes, <laughs> but you talked about the parking lot being 200 meters in. Not how parking. Are, it's a turnaround. Turnaround. Turn, a turnaround, yes. So how is how is how are they going to get beyond that to maintain the other? Uh, are you not? talking about plowing the other 100 meters beyond that turnaround? Well, speaking with uh, Mr. Gatley, the, 
the best spot for the turnaround would be prior to the 300 meter mark. So if we're able to get that section done, that's fantastic. Okay. 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 I follow you. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to point out that there are other uh, township roads that are not maintained in the wintertime. So we would, it would, uh, it would require more than just uh, approving a budget to do it. We would actually have to uh, approve assuming that portion for maintenance. Correct. Uh, uh, Holly, you had your hand up. So I just want to clarify um, the comment about Hay Lake Road. So it, my recollection was in last year's budget, we had it in for design. We removed it with the intention that we were going to not design it, rather just uh, resurface it. And I think that the the um, when Dave was speaking to the PowerPoint that I just had up, he misspoke and said Hay Lake instead of Hay Creek. So I just want to be clear that we didn't have Hay Lake Road in the budget to design. Um, because we decided we weren't designing it. And at the last meeting, the council meeting, Councillor Florent and Councillor Shala suggested that there were some things in the, that could go into the 2020 budget that would be um, consulted out. So I just want to be clear um, that, that we're all speaking the same language here. Councillor Shala? Yes, last year, I've seen the work what Dave has done and we last season when we in 2020 but approval uh, budget approval we looked at the work that he had done on um, per, uh, Madawaska Street or back in on from the OPP station around to the resource center and I think he was he done it based on his knowledge and he did a good job and when we discussed the $30,000 or whatever last year that was going to, going to go towards the Hay Lake engineering costs of repairing the road or to re uh, improve uh, or reconstruct, I think I offered up the suggestion, why would we, if he was going to do, use his expertise and do it with uh, partially with uh, township equipment and maybe some contracting as required, then it maybe would be more uh, economical to uh, to just because it's all crown land area uh, to speak of that he would that we would save that thirty thousand dollars and actually put it towards on the ground work. But now, um, when I heard you speak at a, the previous meeting or a previous meeting about uh, Hay Lake Road seemed to be left off the list. So, but it sounded to me last year, it was, well, we'll do the engineering last year and we'll do the, the repairs this year. Um, I may have misunderstood you, but that was my understanding. Then I'm thinking, well, uh, when it seemed to be left off at the last meeting, I'm thinking, well, maybe we better bring it up again and actually i received a coincidentally i received a an email and which i forwarded to i think it went to the mayor and holly and to dave uh from the hay lake area and um so if it's if it's going to be necessary that we in order to do the road that we have to do an engineer study then when I heard Dave earlier, I thought, well, he's speaking about Hay Lake Road, but maybe he was speaking about Hay Creek Road. So let's be clear here. And I uh, I'd appreciate it. And I appreciate you uh, bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Can you clear that up, uh, Dave? Uh, I'll try. Um, so yes, we were going to look at doing a Hay Lake Road as a resurfacing and drainage improvement project as we did our projects the last two years. And then I believe we had discussion during the last council meeting uh, about moving to more of the Allen Lake model, which would be engineers, consultant, fully contracted uh, scenario. So I, I guess we should probably talk about it, which, which direction council would like to uh, 
you know, proceed with on, on future capital projects. And I can just add to that. So what we heard this summer from a few members of council was that when Dave is doing those capital projects, operations isn't, isn't meeting the expectation of council. So what we're asking is if, you know, we can't have our cake and eat it too. If we're going to do these capital projects with the same people who grade our roads and cut our grass and manage our landfills, then something's got to give. And so what we've heard is we don't want the grass to be extra long or any of those things to slip. So if we're going forward with the, with the method that we did for, for Allen Lake Road, which was completely external, we hired a consultant, they managed everything and our works guys weren't involved, then we can start getting bids for that. But we need to realize that that's going to reduce the amount of capital work that we're, we're able to get done. So we're just looking for some direction. Are we, or is that the path we're going down for Hay Lake? I think, uh, I think it depends on the size of the project. Uh, I think the project that we bid off for this summer with three different roads was just too big and it left shortfalls in a lot of other areas. And if anybody wants to know which council was complaining, it was me because I thought the level of service in the rest of the township dropped dr dramatically this summer as far as maintenance. Uh, got us way behind in culvert replacements and other projects. I think the way to go is the way we did the Allen Lake Road, especially with any contracts I don't know if we could set a dollar limit on it because that's gonna change all the time. But certainly I think this summer's project was, was too much for us. I just wanna state that we were also in a pandemic and all of those projects came in under budget. I don't know what that has to do with it, but Councillor Shala? Yes, Dave, can you give me an estimate or give us an estimate of you already had it up on the screen of what it costs for those roads. And you likely did, you can tell us what percentage uh, you did. If you, con uh, and give us a comparison. If you would have con put that out for contract, what do you feel it would have cost? Off the top of my head, double. So 600,000. Yeah. And I'm probably light. Uh, and I, if I just, would like to say that the strain on our resources this year came from a month and a half delay getting started. The budget was late. I couldn't let any contracts. And yes, we ran right into grass cutting season, the busy season. This was not a good example this year of, of efficiency, uh, but we did, we did get it done. And yes, some things sacrificed. Largely there was a delay. When you let contracts later, you're not getting efficiency in price from your, uh, some of your subs and you're running into the busy season. So unfortunately that's the way that was the result of the COVID that delayed the budget being released and the fallout thereafter. Do you, do we feel or how do you feel that you can speed up the budget approval <laughs> in other seasons? And because we're really, I feel controlled by uh, outside costs coming in. So how soon can we, we're not like a big city with a big reserve. So how are we going to speed this up in the future so that we don't hear from the work superintendent that it wasn't approved in time to get, uh, get the, the, uh, the tenders out? How can we improve on this? I, uh I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, I think that the the issue, I, I'm not sure. I think that the issue was that the works guys were doing capital work when they should have been cutting grass. So I'm not sure why we should defer from that. I don't, I mean, we're going to pave roads in the summertime. We're going to have to, if we, if we start earlier, the grass will be growing faster in the spring. So I'm not sure that moving the budget earlier is going to change the fact that we have, you know, 10 guys on our works department that do the same work. Really I, only I think, one guy can get on, the, only one lad can get on the lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I got, I don't know. I, I, the other thing is, I think it's a, it's a matter of, uh, 
personal preference. I'll tell you the day that Councillor Florent was complaining about the grass at uh, Tom and McMurray Park, I drove out there and I, I thought that it was fine. You know, we do have beaches that are spotty grass, but I think that everybody has their own opinion of what maintenance is. And uh, to be honest, I think most of the time we far exceed our level of service, but uh, we still hear, you know, complaints from specific councillors on a regular basis. Uh, Holly, I guess if, if you, I may, I you, just think if you're that, willing to, excuse me, if you're willing to accept grass up past your knees in a playground area, that's fine, but I'm not willing to accept that. And the day that you went out there was probably the day after I was out there with my own lawnmower and cut the grass. Uh, Mayor Dumas. I think it's sad that we're talking about grass, but I think I would like to say that this council has worked very hard to build up the equipment that we have in our fleet. We have one of the best fleets within the, any area of municipalities that are adjacent to us and extend to uh, away from us down Highway 60. The fact that as a taxpayer, I'm hearing our work superintendent say that we have saved $300,000 by having our own staff do these projects. I think this is... I think it's wonderful. It's something that I, as the mayor of the township, are very proud of our, our works department. We have worked very hard to get qualified individuals, certified individuals on our staff for specific reasons. And I just think it's, it's beyond my comprehension that we, we would be saying that we need to go out and spend double the amount of money to do the work in the township. And um, uh, I think we're fortunate to have the work superintendent that we do that has the knowledge to handle these projects and to bring them in. Perhaps three this year were too much, but I certainly don't support the fact of going out and spending double the money to get work done when we've got the machinery the, and the skill within our works department to do it. Councillor Shala. Yes, I, I like to see everything, everything nice and prim and proper for, uh, for our residents and for our visitors around the parks also. But I guess when I, when I look at it and we've hired students, we get a grant to receive a student. Some years we've even subsidized the student. So we have two students and some of them keep coming back and they're, they're very good. And uh, they do an excellent job when they're doing, when they're, when the job is complete, it's, uh, you, they're, they're proud and we can be proud of it. But all I'm getting at is possibly it's direction and maybe it's not Dave's fault. And I, uh, because he can't be everywhere at once. And, uh, but maybe it's underneath him. It's, I think we, uh, if students to me are hired here to cut the lawn, they're not equipment operators. So if we let them do the job or, or clean the washrooms, if we let them do the job that they're supposed to do, assign them to it, and um, guide them. I just think maybe we can get get it all done. And uh, maybe it is uh, scheduling or guiding or whatever. But uh, I don't think uh, some of this um, lawn maintenance. Dave shouldn't have to be uh, be out there each day uh, telling which blade of grass to cut. Believe me, um, I think that comes from way below him and just. Let the students do their job. I worked, I hired students and uh, showed them what we wanted and worked with them and, and then let them do the job. And they've done a quite a good job. So I think we can do that in our township also. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that wanted, that anybody wanted to discuss? And that includes you, uh, Dave, on the 2021 capital projects? Um. Uh, I would like to mention uh, the state of some culverts in the township. Uh, we had, uh, we've had some sinkholes open. We had one open on Mackenzie Lake Road just recently and we changed the pipes. Uh, they weren't even on our radar, but when we got in there, uh, you know, half the pipes were rotten. They were changed 20 years ago. So, uh, you know, going into 2021, I, I would like to focus on a lot of culvert replacement. We're, these pipes are all coming due. And uh, yes, we, may, we I would have liked to got through a few more this year, but I think it's, it's 
should be a priority for the township to get out and really go at it and you know maybe changing the order of 50 to 60 pipes would probably keep us ahead of the rate they're failing okay uh if we can move on then to the expansion of the Bark Lake boat launch, I was myself that wanted that added to the agenda. And that came out of the meeting that we had with the Algonquins where there's, I anticipate uh, in the next few years, uh, a huge expansion of uh, cottages on, on Bark Lake because uh, just because the natives are going to receive that property initially doesn't mean it's going to stay as a, a campground or something for the natives. I anticipate them opening up like a, a whole bunch of cottage lots. So that boat launch that's there was built over 20 years ago. The launch and the parking lot, the, the launch is, is good. It's in good shape. The dock is in good shape, but the parking lot already on weekends sometimes isn't big enough. And we should, instead of getting behind like we are at the Allen Lake parking lot and trying to come up with more parking, I think we should jump ahead and uh, maybe not in 2021, uh, but as time comes available, it's a very flat land there where that boat launch is. It's very easy to make it bigger. It's a matter of removing the, uh, the, the trees and the overburden and then some, uh, some gravel. So it's something we should be looking at in the next couple of years of uh, expanding that area. I think it could easily be quadrupled in size. Right now, I think there's room for about maybe 18 or 20 vehicles in there. Uh, and I anticipate that there's probably going to be over 100 uh, required in the next few years. Uh, Holly, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, so just further to that, so um, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, we have uh, reached out to our, our planner to talk about official plan updates. There is provision in our zoning bylaw right now that when water access lots are, um, are created that associated parking will be created as well. So that's one of the things that we brought up to the land claim people. Um, the other part of that is when development occurs, there's something called uh, either payment in lieu of or parkland, which means um, that when a large development like that happens, the developer is um, obligated through the Planning Act to provide us with a portion of property or the adequate property for the, the infrastructure that we'll need to maintain or to support that um, that development. So those are some of the things that Tracy and I have been talking to um, um, MHBC about providing council with that type of information. Um, but I think further to that, as we talk about um, going forward with the Algonquins and making um, progress with our relationship with them, I think it would be uh, behoove council to suggest that they provide some type of um, agreement for those because both of those properties that you're talking about, sorry, no, the, the boat launch that you're talking about and the park are both Crown Land LUPs right now. So perhaps there's a an opportunity through this process for us to acquire those lands through the development process. So that's some of the stuff that, uh, that we've asked Jamie to provide report on. I agree with all that 100%, but I still want to point out that even if there's no development, the parking lot is already strained. Sure. Not all the time, but on long weekends especially it is. People are starting to park out along the highway now. You said something, Holly, but your mic was off. I just said, yeah, all of our boat launches are that way. Absolutely, mm -hmm. they are. Okay, if nobody has anything to add, add, I will ask for a motion of adjournment and then request. Sorry. sorry. Yes, Councillor Collins. So, sorry, um, I, I thought there would be a little bit of an opportunity here. Um, I've been approached by someone who used to live in the township who doesn't anymore that said the Recreation Committee um, at the boat uh, Bark Lake boat launch actually put a trail into the area um, 
a, a walking trail, an interest trail, a heritage trail, for want of better terminology, to something they call an H tree. And that would actually, if that was developed, that would be something, again, um, that is important for recreation in the area. And that would increase some of the parking possibly needed um, for that Bark Lake boat launch. And I wondered if um, in time the, the Recreation Committee can have a look at that and see if that can be expanded on again. That area is 100% within the land claim area. That was my reason for bringing it up now. But the land claim and the Algonquins in particular say that they want to um, adhere to heritage and, and um, allow recreation trails that are already there to be maintained. That was my understanding. I've, that recreation trail was in the planning process, but it never really happened. The, okay. the, the, there's, no, there's no trail there. Okay, so it never went beyond that. I, I'm unaware of this, and I, I, I tried to get down there now, but I, I can't get in there now. So um, it never actually took off. Okay. There was actually right. there was actually two trails discussed, one up to that tree that you mentioned, and the other was out you know, into the marsh. But nothing ever happened with them officially? No, no, no they never. Okay. All right. Thank you for that information. Anybody else have anything? Can I have a mover for adjournment? Uh, Councillor Vermeer, seconded by Councillor Collins. I would request a couple minute recess. Yes. We've been here for a long time. We've got a long way to go yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I guess, uh, Holly, are you there? No. What's going on here? Yes, Richard, I'm here. I just couldn't find uh, my unmute because the screen is messed up. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, the waste management meeting, I uh, would like to uh, call them, open the meeting or call the meeting to order. There's agenda before us. Does anyone have any additions? None noted. Can I get someone to adopt the agenda? Moved by Dave, seconded by Joey. Thank you. Does anyone have a pecuniary interest to disclose? None noted. Unfinished business. Um, review the waste management bylaw. Uh, Holly, I will let you, I'll pass this over to you and uh, whether you uh, we want to go through this, I have, but I don't know too sure if everybody else has. So, uh, I'm going to pass that to um, Dave Gatley. If I can, can I see you, Dave? Yeah, yep. um, Dave. If you want to take this conversation, sure. I I just wanted to talk about a couple of things within the bylaw and maybe some changes that we can consider. Uh, I'll just start off by letting you know that uh, a lot of things have improved. We've, uh, we've got some messaging out there about uh, putting garbage in bags and uh, that's, that's been going well. People have been covering their, their waste and uh, getting it out on time. So things are going well, but one area we're still having a little trouble with 
that we haven't really uh, got any messaging out about is the size of waste containers that the guys are dealing with. So we still okay, have. Can we go down to that section? Can we drop down uh, to that section? Sure. It's it actually under approved containers. It's under definitions. It would be on page two of the bylaw, very top of the page. Okay. So if someone can drop the screen down. So, uh, sorry. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yep. I'm not sure what's happened, but I've lost all of my, I've lost my ability to see you guys. So if I'm just going to be quiet for a minute and you guys carry on and I'll try to figure out. Okay. We can hear you and we can see the screen. Uh... Yeah. So if, if, if I may, uh, chair, uh, under approved containers, we're asking that the maximum container size be 30 gallons, which is a normal garbage can that you would buy in a store, but we still have a number of people using, uh, 45 gallon drums or 50 gallon drums, depending where you see it. And some of them have the narrow tops, uh, very difficult for the guys to handle. And in a lot of cases, they're throwing loose garbage in them. And, uh, you know, the guys aren't able to actually pick up the containers because they, they're so heavy. Uh, and then in a few other cases, we have people that have bought uh, some businesses, actually, people that have purchased very, very large garbage cans that are designed to be mechanically unloaded, um, they're well beyond the 30 gallon limit. Um, it, it's not a huge problem within the township, but it exists. So I, I just like to get some messaging out, you know, perhaps in a, uh, a newsletter or something, uh, you know, this year to, to bring that to people's attention and see if we can get them to get these approved containers. I think it would help the guys on a health and safety level and uh, be a little more efficient. Uh, the second place. Dave, before you leave, before you leave that container, I realize uh, what you're what you're getting at. There was a few places where I noticed there are some uh, garby um, forty five gallon drums, and I just think a couple of the locations. I thought it was because of the of the wind and along the highway. Because a small container or a regular container, if it was in those spots, it would likely be blown down the highway as soon as it was empty. Yeah, I suppose that's... Uh, Which might yeah, be a hazard. Could be, uh, you know, but they're, uh, they get, they're pretty heavy for the guys to pick up, uh, especially primarily the ones with the narrow tops. I don't know if you've seen those, but they're in a few locations where they're not a normal drum, but they're the plastic drum with the uh, the narrow tops so of trying to pull bags and waste out of those containers is, is very difficult. Okay. Okay. I understand. Thanks. Uh, the next section that um, I think we should maybe look at is uh, it would be section starting on section 4.9, which is relating to businesses. That's correct. Collecting waste. Correct. And that note, a note here. Yeah, we have a, just a few sections. It's 4.9 basically to uh, 4.13 that address business pickup. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've been trying to discuss with businesses is, is purchasing where they have a, a lot of garbage is purchasing the uh, containers, the bins that uh, the truck can mechanically unload. Uh, we had, um, you know, things in sheds and we've had uh, sort of containers that weren't suitable. The guys were, uh, you know, having to basically lean into to empty a number of businesses have bought the containers, which has been very helpful. Uh, it speeds up pickup. It gives them protection against animals. And uh, I think it's just a better setup overall. So we just don't have anything in the bylaw about it. You know, businesses that don't have that much waste certainly could continue using cans because some businesses, you know, put out maybe five or six cans and I can see that continuing, but you know, when they're getting into eight cans plus 
or large containers that I was just thinking that we should have some wording in the bylaw requiring businesses with a certain amount of waste to buy the, uh, the containers. Uh, Before you leave thing, that section. Sorry, I uh, want to go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just one other uh, uh, comment is that we're trying to get, encourage, uh, you know, all of our uh, residents and businesses to uh, help us reduce our waste that's going in the landfill site. So a number of them have been bringing their uh, construction and demolition waste to the landfill site, but a lot of that stuff is still going in the containers. Uh, and I realize it's difficult for certain businesses to weed out boxes and things like that. But I just wondered if there might be some way to encourage businesses or require businesses to bring their construction demolition to the C and D piles so it can be shredded. Uh, when it goes in the bins, it goes in the truck and it has to be buried in the hole. So in some cases, we're getting, uh, you know, two by fours and we've had barbecues and we've had microwaves. The guys have had to pull out of these things. Um, but maybe, maybe it could be done through messaging. Perhaps it, we could address it in the bylaw somehow. Uh, just, just to try and help us preserve our landfill sites. And that's the end of my thoughts on that section. Anybody have any comments on 4.9? Oh, shoot. I do. Richard? I oh. Yes, go ahead. It, it's Jane Richard. Dave, how many of those large bins do we have? Like just a, a ballpark figure? The township that, ourselves? No, I mean that the businesses, ha businesses have uh, and are utilizing. Uh, well, uh, we have had probably another five added, no more than that, probably six added in the township this year where they've either built them themselves or purchased them. And I think we have probably 15 overall, just at a, at a quick, yes. Okay. But when you said someone built one, that you can't leverage that to dump it into the compactor then, right? They actually borrowed one of our containers and made a template and constructed the exact same container. So yes, they can. Oh, that Okay, that's very good then. Okay. Yeah, those businesses had the ability to do that. Well, I certainly think that if a business is putting out more than, you know, four regular garbage cans, then they need to start looking at, at these, these devices for the safety and well-being of our staff. I have okay. a comment. Uh, I have a ahead, comment. Joe. Go ahead. Uh, it's our, our garbage compactor truck uh only picks up household waste uh which is might be classed as wet garbage uh but uh cardboard boxes and lumber and things like that it should be common sense that they don't go in those containers but obviously they need a reminder so either just a letter to the uh, offenders might be the best, easiest way to address it instead of changing the bylaw they like if you can change the bylaw all you want, but unless somebody's reading the bylaw, they're not even going to know about it. Good point. I agree. Now, 4.9, I have a comment. I, I didn't think we were going in any of these storage buildings anymore. Yeah, me too. We, there was still a little bit of it going on and uh, that has stopped during this year. Uh, there were some businesses that were, or some shelters that were hazardous. It was camps primarily, and they were using garden sheds. So with the, uh, the increased risk, uh, this year, uh, we spoke to those businesses and, uh, they, they've ceased to use them. Excellent. Good job. Um, uh, now, so would we all agree then, uh, uh, just discuss in this section that you prepare a letter and maybe you can even circulate it around at our next next waste management meeting of and then we could comment on the letter itself and of what you're going to send out to the businesses because likely a, a good portion of them are summer use and i fully agree and i think we talked i believe last early last year about encouraging the businesses to only put the wet garbage in the bin, as was previously mentioned here, 
and that the cardboard be taken um, as a side trip to the landfill area and put in the proper uh, location. So um, if the letter can be drawn up and um, council support and then move, be, we just move forward. So, uh, but I don't think for a minute that they should even take the, be lifting any of that even out of that bin. If it's their bin, leave it in there. If the barbecue is in the bin, leave it there. They'll uh, catch on and eventually take it to the waste uh, transfer station themselves. Trouble, Richard, is I think when you're dumping them mechanically, you can't sort it out unless you throw it back in the bin. Oh, okay. Okay, good point. Uh, so may I speak? <laughs> but Dave, you will notice speaking of garbage there in collection, I, we had an issue in the ward I represent and it was ongoing and the garbage was put out and there was a heck of a mess. And I actually spoke to the operator of the truck and asked them not to pick it up and left a note for them uh, about the days that the garbage, the, the landfill was open, uh, the times, what went in, what went in out in, uh, in garbage bags and what was left alongside the road. And actually there was a huge improvement except for one item that's, uh, it's been there for quite a while. So maybe possibly they need a reminder, but I took it upon myself because I didn't like, uh, I didn't want our staff feeling obligated to clean it up as they went by. And uh, I think there's been a huge improvement, but they just need a, another reminder. And I think it'll be hundred percent great. We do okay, get next. Sorry. 412 is similar, isn't it? Pardon, sorry, was that Richard? 412 is, uh, talks about the sheds also, I believe. Oh. Yes. I guess my only reason for wanting to add something to the bylaw, we just don't actually say anywhere that only uh, household garbage goes in the bins. Um, we say things like uh, it will be serviced as it has been in the past. So when I we can ask the businesses at this point in time to participate, but we really have nothing in the bylaw that says that's what goes in these containers. And that, that I guess that was my only hope that we, uh, you know, maybe added something of what kind of material goes in those containers. Okay. But for, uh, 412, or uh, yeah. we should be removing that. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be even have it in there that we're only the existing storage buildings will be entered. We should, that shouldn't be there. That, yes, that would be another thing that should be updated. And the same with the 4-9, it should be taken off of there. I agree. Okay. Okay. Should be section. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I okay, just have a comment for me. Go ahead, Bongo. Uh, yeah, uh, Dave, a couple times you've mentioned uh, messaging that we need, uh, some messaging. Um, once again, I'm reminded that we really need to be more present on social media. Uh, if we do get this economic development intern, uh, I'd love for that person to dedicate a portion of their time. Once a week, we could probably uh, broadcast a waste management reminder, 52 waste management reminders once a week type of thing. Um, I don't think that... I, as good as letters and the newsletter is, um, I think we should really be pushing all of this messaging on social media. I know that we don't have that routine right now at the moment, um, but uh, this is something that we could think about uh, for the future, especially seeing as how the works department is, has been bringing it up that we do need to improve uh, and increase the amount of waste management messages that we're broadcasting out to the public. And, just one more thing to add, um, as uh, you know, in, in my personal life, I understand that uh, the whatever the garbage compactor comes to pick up, uh, I don't know, in, in my mind, I know that metal and microwaves, like those things are not supposed to be there. So I don't know if that is um, uh, just uh, the, uh, the owners not knowing that rule. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that definitely shouldn't be happening. But anyways, I'm done. I have a comment, 
uh, Richard. Go ahead, Joe. It's a 416, and I only bring it up because it's right in front of me and reminds me. Uh, and I certainly understand when uh, people don't put their garbage out in containers and an animal gets into it. I don't have any sympathy for them. But recently, I did see one case where it was out in a plastic garbage can, the correct size, and apparently a, a dog or something upset it. I'm not sure what upset it, but it was out in a can, so they didn't put it out upset. And then uh, an hour or so later, the garbage truck come by and, and didn't pick it up. And I know that's our practice, not to clean up spilt garbage. And it says that in the bylaw. But in this case, because the owners both worked away from home and they weren't back to the home until like five or six o'clock that night. The little bit of a problem there was when the garbage truck went by was a huge major problem by five o'clock. So I'm just looking to give our employees a little bit of leeway that if they can pick it up without becoming contaminated themselves and maybe the addition of a pitchfork and a snow shovel on the side of the truck, like it's not, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, I've certainly had, I've put my, thought I'd cheat and didn't, wouldn't, didn't have to pick the container up and threw the garbage out in a bag and I paid for it. I had to pick it up when I come home from work. But uh, in some cases, a little bit of a problem when the truck goes by becomes a major problem by five or six o'clock. I, I agree. And then it's not a, the neighbor's problem then either. That's correct. And our, our trucks are finished. Like they, they do a fantastic job. They collect all the garbage in township in three days, basically, but they're, they're finished early. Uh, there's, they're, it's not that we're constrained by time that we can't stop and pick that up. And I understand that it's, we don't want our attendants to be picking up raw garbage with their bare hands. So, you know, a, a snow shovel or a, or a pitchfork in some cases could alleviate a lot of the problem. I could Joe. respond to that through the chair, if, if I may. Go ahead, uh, Dave. I did look into that incident, Joe, when I, I talked to the guys, and they told me that when bags are ripped, they take as much as they can that's still in the bag, but they're not picking up, you know, individual paper and things like that that have been scattered. Uh, from what I'm hearing back, those incidents are very few and far between. And uh, the guys did reassure me that they are taking what they can that's left of the bags that are ripped. So I'm not quite sure what actually happened on, on that incident, but they, they did tell me that that's what their practice is. <clears throat> okay, Dave. Yep. So you can continue there. Uh, well, that's that's about all I had to, to mention on that. I don't have any other uh, comments on the bylaw other than just one other thing back to uh, businesses with the proper storage container or storage containers uh, or bins or what have you. I haven't seen it myself, but I did hear that uh, in some cases people are stopping by businesses that have bins, uh, you know, coming out of Algonquin Park and putting waste in the business's uh, container. So I also don't know if it might be something to consider to, you know, ask businesses to keep them locked or uh, secure to stop those kind of things from happening. Mm -hmm. It used to happen quite often when there was a container uh, where Algonquin Bound now is. And the biggest offender that I seen there was the AFA throwing uh, empty paint cans in it watch them doing it several times yeah well that's the communication between the owner and the and the and the i guess the people that own it anyone else have any comments on the bylaw if we i i read through it and i'm wondering up at 312, just a trivial, but it might, I'll just look for your comment, 312. I thought there should be a comment, a comma in there. Uh, in addition, 
comma on the second line. Okay. You see that? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, should it have a, a comma there prior to no person shall? And down in 6.1, just for, I don't know, I think I raised this before. I'm just thinking of the, the attendance at the waste transfer station. How do we deal with tipping fees and to protect them and do we issue a receipt if they're if someone pays for a mattress on site is there a receipt issued or do they document that on their daily uh, worksheet or whatever that someone dropped off a mattress and paid five bucks or whatever how are we, uh, so we're, everybody, everything is transparent and really what we're doing, if we, if there's either a receipt or it's on that sheet where they ask you where your, what your uh, address is, if there was somewhere, it was, I, I guess I'm wanting to know, how do we keep track of this? And uh, it's all for their protection because if somebody accuses them of not turning the money in, how do we deal with that? And where should it be? Actually, both are done, uh, and a receipt is issued, and it's recorded in their book. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. The tickets uh, are should we say that copy should, comes to the office. Should we say that right there? Uh, we could outline the process, I suppose, if if you'd like to include that in the bylaw. Well, I'm just thinking that if we did say something, t tipping fees are uh, recorded on site and uh, are documented on site and. Uh, it's just so that it protects the two people. It, uh, they're not going to be falsely accused of something down the way. And uh, okay. And sure. if they all they do is uh, submit a name and the bill goes out later, well, that's fine too. So Most people take the receipts. Some people uh, don't want them, but uh, they are all, all offered receipts. Okay. Okay. And that, that's okay. But as long as it's recorded somewhere in that, on that, uh, the daily. Um... Yeah. And just to, uh, to give you the rest of the process. So the, the tickets are in triplicate. So there's a, a copy for the office, a copy for the resident. And uh, there is a log kept. And then that log is brought into the office and it is reconciled and balanced before it goes into the general ledger and is deposited. Okay. That's great. That's good news. Okay, that's all know. I have on that. That's all I have on the on the, the bylaw. Does anyone else have anything? Richard, if I can just add to Dave's comment that um, there was a short time during COVID where we had to change some procedures and um, receipts weren't necessarily um, provided, um, but the landfill site tenants did document this. So I don't know if you're kind of thinking back to when. Um, just recently that this has happened or you're looking for just in future uses, but I just, um, there was a short time where, okay. I just want to make sure that no one falsely accused uh, one of our attendants of maybe not submitting five bucks. It'd be pretty, yeah. uh, we don't need that. No, we don't. You're right. Okay. Uh, if you can pull up, no one has anything regarding the bylaw. We can pull up the agenda again. Okay, Dave, regarding new business. So we're into the uh, spring, summer waste collection. I think we've had some of that discussion. I, I was gonna give you a little feedback on the uh, Mackenzie Lake pickup from this summer. Yes, appreciate uh, it. So on average, we once people got the hang of it, we have about 12 to 15 people showing up there regularly. And uh, 
Floyd has noticed that uh, most people typically don't even start to show up till 930. So he thinks he could save half an hour on that location. Uh, they all come at once. It doesn't take long to receive them. And that would give him an extra half an hour uh, before he goes out there to, to maybe address some of the other bins, you know, when the businesses are getting busy in the summertime. That'd be fine. And as soon as, whenever we make that decision and we post it on, uh, on the calendar that we circulated around to the, the association, then everybody be aware of it and move forward. There's no point in him sitting there if he's, uh, if there's no one showing up. I have a comment, uh, chair. Yes, uh, go ahead, Joe. Whatever we do, I think it's very important that we continue the Sunday pickup from the campgrounds. Uh, when we stopped doing that, when we started the, the uh, Mackenzie Lake thing, it, uh, it disrupted it quite bad and it created a lot of problems. When we resolved that and we got through it, but I just want to avoid that for next summer. With that, so, they, okay, go ahead. Sorry. So if we're, going to, if we're going to be a half hour less time at Mackenzie Lake, uh, I, I think it would probably resolve the problem. I can just uh, add to that, if, if I may. Yes. Um, so in the beginning, uh, you know, we reduced some of the service to the camps. And then when, the, you know, the feedback came in, uh, I instructed, uh, well, it's Floyd, to, uh, you know, service those businesses as required and, uh, you know, uh, put in some overtime need be. And he did that. And really the overtime has been minimal. It, it's not regularly even. It, it was an hour here and there through the summer. So I, I think that half an hour would even reduce that more so that we may, you know, we may not see any overtime, but the overtime that did occur, I think in the entire summer might've been a total of five hours, something of that nature. I'm wondering if um, our waste collection doesn't show it now, and I'm just wondering if it should, and it's more transparent, uh, and that's what we should be, I think, is if the, uh, if the waste collection calendar showed the commercial collection also. So it's all, of, it's all above board and what we're doing, and uh, it's showing the taxpayer what they're paying for. And mm -hmm. um, you know, We just... Not a lot of room on that calendar, but we'll. Uh, we can if we look could look that. at it for the spring. Tracy's nodding her head, so that's good because she's the one who has to fit it on there. Maybe some of the printing and the writing down below wouldn't have to be on every time or something. I just think it would. Uh, it shows everybody what's happening and. You can understand maybe why the truck um, is busy or isn't busy or whatever it may be. It just being that this is transparency. Okay. Just making some notes. So uh, we will look at trying to include that on a proposed collection calendar for the spring. Okay. Excellent. Now, uh, do you have anything else, Dave, on uh, new business? No, that's all I had. Does anyone else have anything on waste management they'd like to bring up? Uh, Councillor Shala, it's Jane. I'd like to just ask something of Dave, if that's all right. That's fine. Okay, Dave, um, I, I, this is personal experience and observation at the Whitney landfill. And um, I noticed I was, I was taking aluminum uh, drink cans to put into the, the bin there. And I noticed a lady beside me, she was putting her aluminum cans into the, the bins that we have for the other cans. And um, then I went to empty mine and I could barely reach tippy toes to put mine in that huge bin. So, and I don't know what we have in Madawaska for aluminum, but she had put all her very finely crushed aluminum um, drink cans into the bin that was not the aluminum. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about having a step or something there that people that are vertically challenged can't reach to put their things into that huge bin. Um, right. I don't, I, I don't know the difference between remuneration that we get back for aluminum and the other cans, but I mean, people are making the effort and then 
when you get there, I, I have difficulty putting my stuff in. My husband usually puts it in and I was alone that day. So just a thought to look at that. Yeah. In, in Madawaska, they've, they've got a 45 gallon drum. They've been uh, accumulating aluminum cans in and the attendants have been dumping it into the bin, but okay. we could possibly look at a stair with a railing. Uh, it'd have to be securely built. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make it onerous, but yeah, it's, not a, it's not a bad idea. I mean, a lot of places. I don't know if it's a, if it's a, like, is it more better money for. Definitely. We get more money for aluminum than steel. Uh, it's, it's, we get quite a bit more actually. Okay. I uh, think, uh, I think the mayor has raised an excellent point because when I was putting my cans in there a week or two ago, uh, I'm maybe a bit taller than the mayor, and it was uh, by the time I reached over and tore the bag open that they were in and uh, dumped them in, I could see where somebody uh, a bit shorter would have uh, have a problem. So I think it's a great, good suggestion. And, and also the crushing. Um, I noticed some were, weren't crushed, some were crushed. Uh, the crushing uh, certainly would uh, expand the the use of the the, the big 40 yard container. We've been, uh, when the steel pickup comes, they crush the container down for us. And if we happen to have the excavator in the landfill site, we crush it down with the excavator. Oh, okay, okay. Main thing is, is getting to the landfill anyway. True. I did have one other bit of news. Uh, and that is that we have received both of the uh, C containers for the electronics that uh, council approved they are now in both landfill sites. Um, definitely will help with operation. Okay, uh, I guess if that's, uh, if there isn't any, any other issues, um, we can get a mover and a seconder to adjourn. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Okay, moved by Joe. I'll second. Seconded by Jane. Thank you, and uh, I, I'm gonna plug in here. Am I getting the notice my battery's low here? So. Okay. okay. Everybody in agreement to adjourn? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So Holly will put up the agenda for the emergency services committee. Oh, I was just going to go get uh, fire chief Kruger, but I see he's on there. Good. I'm working on it. Um, Okay, I don't have any, uh, Don, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, I don't have any access to turn your mic on or off, but I think that it might be off. Okay, should I go ahead, Holly? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So this is the meeting of the Emergency Services Committee on um, Wednesday, November 25th. And I have an agenda. We have the agenda in front of us. Are there any additions or amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder? If you could just say it out loud because I'm looking at the agenda. A mover? 
What happened here? Yes, I'll move it. Thank you, Councillor Florent. A seconder? I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Vermeer. Uh, with the business before us with this committee, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Hearing none, thank you. Any unfinished business from previous emergency services committee meeting? Okay, all right. So the item before us this morning is the report from Chief uh, Fire Chief Don Kruger in regards to um, a fire permit process. And I would uh, ask Holly to bring that up. Thank you very much. And Chief Kruger, did you want to speak to this, please? I think he must be muted. Okay. Uh, how can we text him? Shall I go ahead then? <laughs> Wait, where is he? You're muted. Perfect. Okay, so uh, Chief Kruger, if you could go ahead. Something seems to be wrong, Holly. It looks like it's just connecting to your audio. I'm not sure. Have you used that computer before, Don? Is he able to call in? I could ask him if he wants to use mine. Just one moment. <laughs> what are you doing? Showing the neighbors you're such a good lady. You're doing the driveway. Hello, good morning. I was having trouble with my uh, microphone on my computer for some reason. All right, thank you very much. Um, we, we've introduced your report. Don, if you'd like to go through it, that would be great. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm recommending is that uh, we move to a proper fire permit system. Currently, we don't really have a, a proper permit system. We just have a system where uh, if anybody wants to have a fire in the township, they either email me or they phone me. Um, this doesn't uh, allow us to really track who's having a fire. Um, if, if I get an email, obviously I can track it that way. But if I get a phone call, depending on what I'm doing at the time that I get the phone call, I may not necessarily be able to track or record that uh, somebody's having a fire. Um, this system uh, that I research called the burnpermits.com allows us to have an online system. Uh, it provides a website as well as a phone number for people to either log on to the website or they can phone in and record that they're having a fire. And then it allows us to disseminate information to the residents. Uh, for example, if there was a, a fire ban in place. Um, and then so obviously it tracks everybody that's having a fire. And, and allows us to know where there's fires happening uh, without staff really having to do anything. Okay. That's, that's the basic gist of it. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I have a few questions. Go ahead, uh, Councillor. Uh, I'm wondering how many uh, permits we 
have in here, but maybe that's not a good judge if we don't have a proper system. And I don't know how it degenerated into that because it, there used to be a permit system where they had to apply for a permit and then get one before they could burn. But the part that I, I don't like in this is that you've included campfires. And I really don't know how you could possibly police that because all the campfires wouldn't be by residents of the township. They could have a lot of them would be visitors to the township because we include a lot of crown land. Uh, I don't have any problem with uh, things like that or a old decrepit building, et cetera. But I, I just don't like the inclusion of campfires. And even if it was by residents, it appears to me that it's a one-time permit and then you just call in and report every time you're going to have one. But anybody that has grandchildren knows that sometimes the decision to have a campfire is spur of the moment and it, it's within five minutes on a, Sunday evening or something like that, that it would come up. Uh, and I would, I would assume that at certain times of the year, especially on long weekends, there would probably be well over a hundred campfires in the township at the same time. Yes. Yeah, so the, the fire permit is, is for the property. So in the case of say the, the trailer parks, the owner of the trailer park would, would apply for the permit. And then they would they would be policing their own property as far as as fires and making sure that uh, residents of the trailer park are, are abiding by the rules. As far as campfires, um, if if that particular wording needs to be changed, we could absolutely change that. Um, but as far as policing it, we're not really worried about policing it per se. We're more worried about just having an idea as to who's having fires and when. And if, if they want to have campfires, they would still require to, to get a permit. The permit's good for the entire year. So even if say they have, you know, as you said, a spur of the moment to campfire in the evening with their grandkids or whatever. And if they don't log that in, we do still have it recorded that they have a burn permit. So even if they don't necessarily record or call in every time they're having a campfire, we still know that they have a burn permit and that they're aware of all the rules. And if there was a, a burn ban in place, then they would get notices, whether it's by email or text message, that there is a burn ban in place. And then if they do have a campfire and there's a burn ban in place and we get a call for it, we can then, you know, police it, as you say, and and uh, it can be dealt with accordingly. How would you deal with the hundreds of campfires mm -hmm. on Crown land within our township? Uh, probably well, not, this... most of them not by residents of a township, so they wouldn't have any idea because there's no provincial requirement to have a permit. So in, in that case, we, we just have to do the best we can. I mean, if somebody's uh, camping out in the woods somewhere and they have a fire for cooking or warmth, that's not necessarily something that we would police. Um, but again, no, no system is, is perfect and we would do the best that we can. Um, this is, is more so geared for residences and cottages. Uh, if somebody's out camping out in the middle of the woods, obviously there's no, there's no way we could um, manage something like that. Um, and we would just hope that, uh, you know, they're using common sense and they're not, uh, they're taking the proper precautions when they have a fire out in the woods. And as I said uh, about the campfire bees, if somebody has a fire that, uh, you know, gets out of hand or somebody calls to complain, then that becomes a bylaw matter and, and we would deal with it accordingly. But how could you have a bylaw to outlaw a campfire when they don't, bylaws only pertain to residents. Well, and actually only to municipal prop tax property. So it's got nothing to do with Crown land. Well, exactly, that's my point, right? If they're having a fire out on Crown land somewhere, there's really not, we can do to prevent that. We would hope that they would file, follow proper precautions. And I mean, the only way that we would become involved in something like that is if, if the fire got out of hand and the fire department had to respond or, if somebody did see them and called to, to lodge a complaint. 
Otherwise, we're not going to know, right? And we can't police something that we don't know about. Okay, well, that, uh, that brings up another problem. Then the first couple of years, you're suggesting a no fee, and I agree with that. But at some point down the road, I'm going to have to pay a fee to have a campfire in my yard, but the, somebody from Ottawa can come here and have a campfire 10 feet off of my property, and they don't need a permit. Well, I, I, sense. I, again, we, we can't police people that are, are doing things that uh, might be against the law or contravene our bylaws. Oh, no, it's not against the law. You All can have a campfire on Crown land. Again, yeah. but you're not, you're not, uh, you're not a property owner and, and you're not a resident. So oh, there's so not I, really anything we can do about that. Mm -hmm. I think um, Holly's got her hand up. <laughs> go ahead, Holly. So, Councillor Florin, I'm a bit confused. The start of this conversation, you were saying that we had a permitting system and you weren't sure how it went by the wayside, but now it seems that you don't believe that we should have a permitting system because we have Crown land? I don't think a permitting system should include campfires. I'm 100% behind okay. a permitted system. So I think from my perspective, when Don brought this, the intention would be to create a system by which our residents, a lot of them cottagers, would be able to gain information or provide information specific to burning. So I think the intention is starting a new communication with these people. And one of the benefits we saw was being able to push out uh, fire ban information, which as you know, is very labor intensive for the township. We, when there's a fire ban on, we run around like chickens and put up signs at every entrance and every road system. So I think from that perspective, just starting the conversation using a tool like this to get an understanding of who's burning, what they're burning, and provide Dawn with the ability to, to push out information from our bylaw is just really focused communication that we're looking to do. Um, so I don't think it's about really policing the situation. I think it's more about public communication. Don, am I, am I off the mark there? No, that's that that's a hundred percent correct. Yes, I mean, we we would love to be able to control who has a fire at all times, but that's that's not possible. Uh, this system gives us the ability to better manage it, as well as providing information in in a timely manner. But you're only going to get your message out to the people that buy permits, or we we're proposing a two year no fee to try it. It's $500 a year. We're just suggesting that council give it a try. And if we get, you know, if we get 150 people signed up to it, that's 150 people that we have the ability to push out fire ban information to that we don't currently have. If you in two years decide that this program is working and it's worth the 500 tax dollars of tax dollars to put in the budget, then we'll keep it at no fee. But I think the idea was to get the system, see if we can make it work, see if it's useful to us, kind of as a pilot. And then if you're against, you know, charging for burn permits, then we don't need to do that. I'm not against charging for bur burn permits. I, I, I'm surprised that we're not charging for burn permits because we used to. Uh, I'm just opposed to permitting campfires. I think it's a useless uh, venture, a wasted time venture. I, if I, I'd like to speak to that. I think it's really important. And uh, when we used to have face-to-face -face cottage association meetings, this came up. And the fact that we have a huge amount of Airbnbs in the area, and one of the attractions on, you know, the, the, the cottages on lakes where they do Airbnb, one of the attractions, and I heard that from the, you know, the permanent cottagers themselves, was the ability for those individuals to come and have a fire. So I think if we had it on on record that this, you know, that this 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 area, this home has a permit for fires, you know, campfires or whatever, then you know we know. And if we know it's an Airbnb, I think it's important because uh, I, you know, talked about insurance that people have for their Airbnbs, and that they must be aware. It's my understanding that they're, you know, they are accountable for any fire that is built on their property, be it by them or be it by, you know, someone that's using their property as an Airbnb. And I think that's a huge risk to the township at this time. Um, 
you know, not everyone knows how to put a fire out properly and, and uh, roots can catch on fire, etc. So I think the more nets that we have to ensure the safety of, you know, our, our, our properties and our people, it's really important. So I certainly support this. Anyone else have a comment? Can I go ahead? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bongo. Sure. Uh, upon first glance, I, I like this initiative. Um, a, it, uh, it increases the amount of public engagement and public education about uh, fires and fire safety. I think it also gives us an idea of um, how many people are having fires. Obviously, it's not going to give us a completely accurate picture, but if there was a fire um, emergency, uh, perhaps, you know, it, in the fallout of the emergency, we, we could at least say, hey, you know, this this person had a uh, had an un um, an unpermitted fire at, at, at this residence. And then um, uh, and then, of course, uh, as it was mentioned again, just just pushing out all the information. Um, I have two questions for the fire chief. Uh, number one is um, what is the um, uh, justification of the permits? I'm not completely sold. Uh, on the idea of uh, getting residents to 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 pay for a permit to have campfires, um, so so if you could just tell me a little bit more about uh, the the justification of that campfire fee, um, and the second question was, does this software have any integration with social media? So, for example, if we do have a fire ban, um, will the app, um, will this software? Could it automatically be associated with, say, the township Twitter or the township Facebook account so that these important fire messages are, are, are not only um, being sent out to the people that are subscribed to this software, but, but also to the other social media channels? Thank you. So I'll, I'll answer your, your second question first, Councillor. Um, the, the software or the, the program itself is compatible with uh, the different um, firefighting responding apps. Uh, they use Who's Responding, which is not one that we currently use. Um, so I don't know 100%, but I would say that, yes, it would be compatible with the social media uh, because obviously they've set it up to use uh, this one particular app. Um, so I think certainly it would be compatible with the social media and we would be able to, to do that. Um, that would be something that they would look after on their end for us. We wouldn't necessarily have to do it ourselves. As far as the, this, the first question, it's not so much that uh, we need to charge to have the permits. Um, as, as I outlined in my report, and I believe as Holly alluded to as well, um, we're, we're thinking that if we do maybe two years without uh, charging for it, that that allows us some time to get residents and cottagers to buy in and gauge the usage. The thought of possibly down the road uh, instituting a, a fee would be more so to a regain, uh, you know, try and regain a bit of our costs for implementing the program, but also um, historically when people pay for something, they're a little bit more apt to pay attention to it. Um, and in this case, paying attention to it means actually following the rules as laid out by the, the, the burning bylaw. Mm -hmm. Okay, certainly. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, as it stands, I'm, I'm personally all for uh, a one to two year free pilot program. Um, I'm still wavering on the fee thing, but we would have about one to two years to really decide that um, and, and have a little bit more further discussion about that. But thank you. Exactly. Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Shala, you're muted. You're muted. Richard, we can't hear you. Richard, you're muted. Ah, there you got it. Now okay. we can hear you, Richard. Okay, <laughs> Go ahead. sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Said the host kicked me out. So anyway, <laughs> uh, maybe, that, that was, maybe that was intentional, but uh, uh, you know what? This, this comes as a surprise. 
I um, I have mixed feelings about uh, the difference or the permits and no permits. I certainly agree that we should have a permit, whether it's chargeable or not, for burning brush. Uh, a lot of times, or other debris, a lot of times people, including myself, if we had something to burn other than a campfire, would leave it for quite a period before we uh, decided we were going to burn because we were looking for the proper conditions and with safety in mind. And uh, I think that you can say that about everybody across the township. So may, maybe with a few exceptions. So, but if it required a permit to burn some of this and I would agree, but I'm, um, I'm still not sold on the idea of, of residents that might have want to have that spontaneous fire in the backyard and um, it's a yearly may permit happen, may only happen occasionally uh, so to get it I'm I'm you know what I'm a little bit nervous about that one and uh, I'll just wait to see where we go from here but I'm uh, I'm full agreement with uh, burning per burn, burning permits for for brush or other debris. And however, I live in an area that's fairly, uh, lots of leaves around. And we should be discouraging people from burning leaves. Something that can uh, degrade on its own if it's in a certain spot, but leaves burning and smoldering in backyards uh, for days and days, uh, I don't agree with that at all. Okay, thank you. Holly, go ahead, you're on mute. So I just wanna clarify, this permitting system is an annual permit. We're not asking people to call to log into the system at eight o'clock on a Saturday night to tell us they're having a fire. We're asking them to tell us if they burn within the year. And then we're going to use that information to communicate with them things like you've just suggested. So maybe we send them an update that says, you know, you can take your leaves to the dump. You don't need to burn them in your backyard. So really the intention was to start a communication with the people we're, that are burning in our municipality and begin to communicate the things that we're doing at, on the fire department to help them be safe. So I just I, want to clarify I, that. We're not asking them to log in when they're going to have a fire. It's once a year, one payment, $10. Personally, I would pay $10 just to have a notice come to my phone to say the fire ban has gone up to this level. This means X, Y, Z to you. And I think you know, there's I, lots of cottagers that would pay that $10 for that same service. If you look at it, uh, we have uh, likely 1,300 uh, residents Ten dollars, add it all up. So people are already uh, paying their taxes. So if they can, if we, if there was no charge at all, I could certainly go along with it and um, quite easily. Just so that uh, all then we would be doing is asking people to notify the township if they have these uh, campfires or burning permits, so that would tell them what's going on and and. In a manner, and then we respond. So it's all absorbed through the taxes. But these little nitpicking uh, uh, fees, I'm not in agreement with that. So, any other comments? I, ha I have something. Councillor Collins. Councilor Collins. Councilor Collins. Um, obviously, if we do bring this in, we've got a number of people in the township that now have these big outdoor furnaces which are burning and producing a lot of smoke, et cetera, et cetera. And people that I know that have them throw their leaves and their other garbage into them because they burn so hot. Would we be asking them to have a permit as well, do you think? Yes, so any, 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 outdoor, any outdoor fire, whether, whether it's in a burn barrel or you know, one of those chimneys or, or anything like that. So it would be any outdoor fire, they would require a permit. Uh, so they could go in, you know, January 2nd after the holiday and purchase their, or get their permit for the year. 
And, and then after that, it's a simple matter of either logging onto the website or uh, phoning into the number that the, the burnpermit.com provides to, to log that they're having a fire. Um, the, the, the chimneys and the outdoor furnaces and those sort of things, uh, as well as burning leaves uh, that have been mentioned, all those types of things uh, are, should be if they aren't addressed in the township burning bylaw. And if people are contravening the burning bylaw, then that that's, becomes a bylaw matter. I, I was, sorry, I, I meant the outdoor furnaces, which is people's source of heat for their homes. They, that's oh, the, what I was referring to. Okay, yeah, sorry. So those, those are not, like that is not an, an outdoor fire, right? It's not an open air fire. So it would only, okay. it only pertains to open air fires. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Bongo, go ahead. Uh, just for clarification, let's say we have a campground owner with 25 sites. That campground owner is just purchasing one permit or 25 permits? Just, just one. Just one. Okay. Only one permit. One permit for, for the property. Um, but then we are putting the onus in on the campground owner to make sure that the people on their campsite or in their campground are following the rules. Super, yeah, and, and I could totally see how this app initiative could really start that dialogue between the, uh, the campground owner and the township and just to really push, push that fire safety message, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Councillor Flark, go ahead. Uh, information I'm hearing from Holly is contradictory to the information I'm hearing from Don. Uh, I understand you got, uh, you got a one-time permit, but you have to actually report every time you're going to have a fire. Is that correct? Yes. The, the, once the system is set up, there is a website and a phone number that is provided so that they, they can go in and log when they're having a fire. Yeah, so Holly's incorrect. It's not just go in on January the 2nd and buy your permit and forget about it. No, it, it, it does still require them to, to log in that they're having a fire. It's just in this, in this manner, now we can track when people are having fires or who's having a fire. Um, like I said, if, you know, with regards to your concern about campfires, I mean, if somebody has a campfire and they don't log it, if we don't know about it, we don't know about it, right? We can't do anything about things we don't know about. Um, we are hoping that people will buy in and log when they're having a fire, whether it's a simple phone call or logging onto the website. Um, but ultimately, that's why we want to do it for, you know, for a year or two free and try and get that buy in from the, the residents and the cottagers. Thank you. Any other comments? Sure. Go ahead, sure. Joey. Councilor Vermeer, uh, I just want to say I agree with the initiative. I think it's a great idea. And I have no problem uh, with the fee of $10. Um, I have to pay for a dog tag and uh, creates accountability. And I, I don't see why we're not charging uh, our residents for this permit. Um, I, I'm all in favor of it. Any other comments? I have a quick question. Councilor Bongo, go ahead. Sure. Um, going back to, uh, we were just talking about, okay, there's the one-time fee, and then we want to encourage people to basically log whenever they have a fire. Um, uh, fire chief, if people do not uh, announce through the app every time they have a fire, but they buy their one-time fee, um, do you still think that the initiative will be successful if, if we're getting them to let us know that, that they are going to have fires on their property throughout the year, but they might not necessarily log into the app ever again, unless it's like a burn ban notification. Yeah, I would, I would still say it's a, a success. Um, okay. Because then we, if, if they've gone through the trouble of, of getting a permit, we know that they intend to have a fire and we can therefore at least log that that property may be having fires throughout the course of the year. Um, you know, if, if they don't 
log in and let us know every time they're having a campfire. Not a, a big a big deal in the grand scheme of things. However, if they were say burning a big pile of brush, um, those would be the ones that we'd be more concerned about, anyways, right? And we would hope that if it's something planned like that, like a big brush fire that they're cleaning their their lot or something, as long as they log in for for that sort of thing, that is is probably more of a benefit to to us as the fire department than if they were just having a campfire. Thank you, Councillor Florent. I was just going to make the suggestion if, if it's money we're looking at, do the permits for free and charge the dog owners $100 a permit. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call the discussion. I think personally, the enhancement of the ability to get the fire ban notifications out in a very broad way through the, the membership of the individual's membership into this process is worth it. Is, is worth the whole process. So so this will come to council as a resolution. So uh, we will look at it at, we will just dis discuss it briefly and we will either prove or not move the, the, um, the resolution. However, I sense there's an agreement that this is a good plan. So anything, there isn't anything else on the agenda. Okay, so at this point, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. Councillor Vermeer, Councillor Shala, carried. Everyone get out and do your stuff.